In the time before time, the Great Spirit descended from the heavens, carrying we, the ones called the Matoran, to this island paradise. We were separate and without purpose, so the Great Spirit blessed us with the three virtues, unity, duty, and destiny. We embraced these gifts, and in gratitude, we named our island home Matanui, after the Great Spirit himself. But our happiness was not to last. Matanui's brother, Makuta, was jealous of these honors and betrayed him. Makuta cast a spell over Matanui, who fell into a deep slumber. Makuta's power dominated the land. As fields withered away, sunlight grew cold, and ancient values were forgotten. Still, all hope was not lost. Legends told of six mighty heroes, the Toa, who would arrive to save Matanui. Time would reveal that these were not simply myths, for the Toa did appear on the shores of the island. They arrived with no memory, no knowledge of one another, but they pledged to defend Matanui and its people against the darkness. Tahu, Toa of Fire. Onua, Toa of Earth. Gali, Toa of Water. Liwa, Toa of Air. Pohatu, Toa of Stone. And Kopaka, Toa of Ice. Great warriors with great power, drawn from the very elements themselves. Together they were six heroes with one destiny, to defeat Makuta and save Matanui. This was their story. I know, I know I've let you down. I've been a fool to myself. I thought that I could live for no one else. But now, through all the hurt and pain, it's time for me to respect the ones you love me more than anything. And so with sadness in my heart, I feel the best thing I could do is end it all and leave forever. What's done is done, it feels so bad. What once was happy and now is sad. I'll never love again, my world is ending. I wish that I could turn back time. Cause now the guilt is all mine. Can't live without the trust from those you love. I know we can't forget the past. You can't forget love and pride. Because of that, it's killing me inside. Tumbling down, tumbling down, tumbling down. It all returns to nothing. I just keep letting me down, letting me down, letting me down. In my heart of hearts, I know that I could never love again. I've lost everything. Everything, everything that matters to me matters in this world. I wish that I could turn back time, cause now the guilt is all mine. Can't live without the trust from those you love. I know we can't forget the past. You can't forget love and pride. Because of that, it's killing me inside. It all returns to nothing. It all comes tumbling down, tumbling down, tumbling down. It all returns to nothing. I just
just keep letting me down, letting me down, letting me down. It all returns to nothing. It all comes tumbling down, tumbling down, tumbling down. It all returns to nothing. I just keep letting me down, letting me down, letting me down. It all returns to nothing. It all comes tumbling down, tumbling down, tumbling down. It all returns to nothing. Just keep letting me down, letting me down, letting me down. Welcome everybody to the actual final episode of Gathered Friends season one, uh, as it should be, I suppose. Uh, we are we are here with a very special guest today, of course. That is Mr. Greg Farshti himself. Everybody, uh, round, give him a round of applause. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my daughter applauding too. Hey, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, of course, Mr. Fasti is the uh, you know, the author of much of Bionicle, um, all of the chapter books except for the uh, the first three, uh, all of the comics, and of course all the story serials that were released uh, later on on BionicleStory.com. Uh, so, um, uh, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing okay. We're getting ready for the snowstorm tomorrow. Okay, um, I'm gonna cross. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna cross that off of the sheet. Don't need to that's ask you how your day is. About everywhere now. I think tomorrow it's supposed to be like ice pellets up here. Oof. Yeah, my daughter's looking forward to her first snow day. Hmm. Ah, that's gonna be wonderful. I had to walk. Time I here. had, I had to walk through the barren wastelands of Black Friday because I was out of soda, and it started oh, no. snowing. <laughs> Oh my! I got so many emails yesterday about Black Friday during class. It was like one every five minutes. Please, I don't care. I am flat broke after buying a plane ticket. 
Oh it's yeah, well, Gathered live Friends in... Live is occurring. Uh, no, <laughs> that's also live. along those lines, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, not live, IRL. <laughs> yeah, so this something like that will be occurring around um, around Christmas time, so look forward to that. Uh, but that's not what we're here to talk about today, of course. We are here to talk about the one, the only, Bionicle, of course. That's what this show has been about this whole time. Uh, what we've been building towards, essentially. Um, and so, I think what we should do... Um, you know, for the for the structure of this episode, because of course we didn't do any reading this time. We've been reading the whole time, but now we've finished our reading. Uh, I think I've we should been, just do a I've, little. I've been re-listening to every episode of the podcast to reacquaint myself with our running gag, ah, right. <laughs> and just to make sure that we don't ask the same questions twice. <laughs> yeah. Also, to make sure that we don't use any of our running gags. <laughs> I make no promises, except that. Except I'm going to try not to screw it up. Okay. We've ruined. We've ruined so many things. <laughs> Don't worry, let's it'll be fine. It'll be let's fine. not ruin Greg. <laughs> so anyway, I think uh, for the structure of today's episode, we should just have a little uh, review, a series overview, if you will. Uh, we're talking about each story year in turn for only about you know maybe ten minutes each. Uh, going through, uh, talking with Greg about his thoughts of you know writing those uh, story moments, and um, yeah, just sort of uh, see how it goes from there. So I suppose the first place to start off is, of course, 2001, the story of the Toa Mata, uh, arriving on the island of Mata Nui and all how that turned out. So, uh, Greg, of course, at that time, you were just writing the comics, correct? Yes. Yeah. So um, what, what, was your, what was your sort of uh, creative process there? How much of that uh, story was dictated by the story team and how much was up to you? Uh, well, in 2001, um, we were basically dealing with the stuff that was in the story Bible, um, except for the final resolution of the year, which we weren't dealing with, because at the time there was supposed to be the PC game that was going to deal with the end of the year. Mm, right. right. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask happening. you a little bit about that, too. <clears throat> I wonder who. I wonder if that game will ever come out. <laughs> Drug emoji. Yeah, I don't know if you... Um, I don't know if you've been keeping up with things, but around... Um, uh, was it February of 2018? We actually finally managed to get a hold of a couple builds of that game, and so now that version of the story, as it was supposed to plant to pan out, is now, you know, everyone has been able to see that now. And I'm curious if you, you know, had a chance to look that over, or if it differed at all from what your original story bobble you were looking at was. No, I'm I'm actually not familiar at all with what they were doing with that. Um, I was friends with the guy at Lego who was overseeing the game for a while, and right. um, but I really didn't have any idea what the storyline for it was. Um, there were things that in 2001 that were kind of vague, and there were mm -hmm. things in 2001's Bible where we just said we're totally not doing this because it doesn't make any sense. Right, um, like I remember. I mean, um... Oh, go on, you know go the on. whole, the whole, the whole having the Toa do a haka dance after they found a mask. I was just like, oh, I'm no. That. no, no, no. That was that was a part of early builds of Legend of Mata Nui. We got two builds of the game. One was an early alpha, and one was a late beta. After the alpha took was made before the Maori incident, and so the haka was there. And a lot of other story elements were there, like the names of Tohunga and everything like that. And then the beta was made after that, where most of that content was slimmed down or removed. And it was really interesting to find out that, um, like in the Mata Nui online game, each village had those little circular pits in the center, and it was never really established what those were. But when we found out through Legend of Mata Nui, those pits were actually arenas for the Haka dance. And you'd have, you know, Tohunga standing on each level, and then the Toa and Turaga in the center doing the dance. And it was really, really interesting to find out that, you know, that's how that was supposed to pan out. Thank you for sparing yeah, us from that. Yeah, the, um, Bollocks. I mean, I've, 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 <clears throat> I've yeah, mentioned this before, that my biggest contribution in 2001 was the fact that the Toa had distinct characters because mm -hmm. the yeah, initial that's... Bible was very much, they all talked the same. Yeah. They that all was had something that was... kind of the same no, personality, no. you know, mm -hmm. 
Right. Um, yeah, that was. And I got on the phone with Bob Thompson, and I said, you know, no, this has to be the Avengers. This has to be the <laughs> Justice League. They can't all get along. They can't all have the same personality. It's going to be really boring if you do it that way. And mm -hmm. um, that, uh, and I fortunately I prevailed in that argument. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was something that Legend of Badanui definitely was following to a T as well. Like you get the, the only ones that really followed a different format were Tahu and Kopaka. Mm -hmm. But Kopaka, like every at the beginning of every level, there was an introductory cutscene where each Toa encountered the previous Toa and then handed over the masks that they had collected because that was a mechanic, I guess. And it's Tahu was very brash towards Lewa, but everyone else was basically the same. Lewa didn't speak in tree speak or anything. Nuju didn't speak as birds, but that was also the way it was in the comics uh, in the beginning. Kopaka mm -hmm. was an interesting, Kopaka and Pohatu was an interesting case though, because the introductory cutscene was actually line for line taken from comic number one when Pohatu accidentally buries Kopaka in rubble. Line for line, that was copied and animated, and it was really interesting to see something that, you know, was just taken from another media where everything else was written from the ground up. Yeah. Hmm. That is interesting, actually. Um, it's a fascinating uh, I wonder if they plan to include more comics references in, in, in later builds of the game. It's a if they did, none of it is there anymore. The, the most that we have for extra dialogue later in the game is really cheesy dialogue for Makuta. Makuta himself doesn't exist in any of the builds because that was never finished, but the beta has some lines for him in the code that basically amount to, can you get through my traps, Lewa? I bet you can't. No, <laughs> you have defeated me. <laughs> Even in the unfinished video game, Universe still likes torturing Lewa. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's true. Um, but yeah, okay. So um, yeah, what uh, is there anything much else we can talk about 2001, or do you think we should move on to 2002? Um, well, one thing I wanted, one more thing about Legend of Madanui I wanted to ask quickly, just to clarify. Mm -hmm. um, in the game, you actually collect the noble masks as well as the great masks. And I was told somewhere by someone that the noble masks were basically supplied to the Toa by the Taraga. Is that true? There was always a lot of confusion about whether they were supposed to be collecting both. Mm. And um, and what I was told for the comic was just focus on the greats. And right. don't worry about trying to collect the nobles because you're not going to have room in the comic to deal with the noble masks too. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, we knew that we really never were going to have the Toa wearing them. So mm -hmm. um, that was the emphasis that I was told to put on. So That's a bit of a shame, things. really, because the Noble Masks have like very unique powers of their own that would be useful in certain situations. Like the Matanui Online game showed that off pretty well. Hmm. So you've been using the And terms of course, there like was 2004 was hoping, where those masks yeah. had their great forms. Mm hmm. Mm. Uh, Levi, I think you were to say something. Uh, just you've been using the terms. I was told uh, what I've heard from people. Uh, so, was it at the beginning of the story that you didn't really have a great degree of power over what would be happening? Oh, I mean, I wasn't even on the story team in two thousand one. Oh, right. um, I I I didn't really start to get involved with the team probably until they were planning for 2003. And um, it wasn't really until Bob Thompson left that I had some say on things. But um, mm -hmm. prior to Bob leaving, it was very much Bob told you what the main story was, and that's what the main story was. And oh, right. where did you Al never really... where Alice... Hmm? Hmm? Oh, Alistair? I was going to ask, where does Alice... Yeah, where does Alistair he fall? Alistair, was only, in, Alistair he... was only in one meeting that I was ever in. Um, I think one, most, I'm... most of the work I think that he did on Bionicle was prior to my being involved with it. Okay, um, because I, I remember think that him... I, I don't know how much, I don't know what he created and what he didn't create because there's always been a lot of debate among who did what. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was actually very lucky that I didn't start till October of 2000. Therefore, 
there's never been any debate about my being involved in creating it because I just wasn't involved in creating it. Um, right, that is quite but interesting that you, you joined I, I that I only day, remember him being in one meeting that I was at, uh, and I think that mm. was a story team meeting in Bill, and, and that might have been when we were talking about 2004. But mm -hmm. um, no, he wasn't at any of the meetings that I was at. I think most of his role was in the initial origin of the whole thing. Yeah, okay. because I remember reading an article in some interviews with him about the original story Bible that he drafted up and that it was originally supposed to be like just a three year thing. And the great spirit robot was far less than what it ended up being. And it was more like a, an escape vehicle from another planet. And the Matoran and the Toa were its crew and they had all forgotten their purpose. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, no, nobody knew whether this thing was going to be a hit or not because it was so different from anything Lego had ever done. It is cool. quite interesting too that you came in like in October of two thousand one because it was right at the end of that month that Legend of Mata Nui itself was canceled. No, I, I came in. Last... I came on in October of two thousand. <clears throat> I came on five months before the toy line. Oh, launched. okay. I thought you said two thousand one. My bad. <laughs> No, I, I was uh, I was there I was there for the whole first year of it, but the story bible was done and everything by the time I came on board. Mm -hmm. So, uh, at the time you came on board, was were were you basically told that it that that your work on it might just amount to those three comics at the time if they weren't even sure how long it might go? Uh, well, I mean, originally I wasn't even doing the comics. Um, I ended up doing the comics mainly by chance when it came right down to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, until they saw what the sales looked like uh, initially, they, they didn't know if they were going to stick with this thing or not. I mean, Lego did a lot of things that were one year and out in those days. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so what, what were you brought on, on board for? If not oh, specifically I, was hired, the I was hired to be the Lego club writer. I was the magazine writer. Right, of course. Yeah. Uh, that's what mm. my job was. And uh, they had somebody in New York lined up to write the comic uh, when they finally decided to go ahead with it. And um, <clears throat> I just started doing a script for the hell of it because I'd never done a comic. And um, I wanted to see if I could do it or not. And I started fiddling around. And I did three or four pages, I think. And my boss came in and I said, well, I, you know, just. I just started fiddling around with this, see if I could do it. This is kind of fun. And she said, well, that's good because uh, we need uh, a finished script, approved script in three weeks. <laughs> and that's so really there wasn't going to be time for the New York person to do it. They had to have me do it. And so that's how I started doing it. Because so that, you that's basically fascinating. I, I did a lot of stuff last, like that. It's just like you tinker with something and present it to somebody and sometimes on chance it'll be just like yeah this is great you're hired <laughs> yeah well that's pretty much that's how, pretty much how i started doing the chapter books too i mean wow. kathy was doing the chapter books and mm -hmm. um in 2000 in the spring of 2003 mm -hmm. i contacted the editor at scholastic and i said you know we're making a big change for 2004 we're doing a lot of other stuff that's new, and do you want me to come down to New York and brief you on it? Mm -hmm. And she said, okay, so I went down, and I, I briefed her on the plans for Metro Nui, and um, at the end of it, she said, well, you know, we need one more book for 2003, uh, and we need it in like six weeks, and can you do it? And I said, yes, and she said, well, if you do a good job, I'll give you other books to do, and then from then on, I ended up doing the books. You wow. wrote the entirety of Quest for the Masks in six weeks? Holy oh, yeah. crap. That is well, insane. I mean, I, that, keep in mind, that, that book was 20,000 words. The right. first novel I ever did, I wrote in six weeks, was 100,000 words. So, wow. Uh, I mean, my first three novels that I did before I came to Lego were all 100,000 word books. So, hmm. um, that was a cakewalk compared to that. And here I am, I can barely get a 2,500-word essay done in one night. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't written anything good in years. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure you get that, Josie. Sorry. Hi, you smart. Um, so, Raganuva, you wanted to uh, mention something about Greg's previous work, didn't you? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I had anything specific to ask uh, exactly. I, I have read River of God, 
Uh, mm -hmm. and I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly a very different having only read Bionicle stuff of yours before. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that I had much to ask offhand. Well, my <laughs> ex-wife used to say that was the most depressing book she'd ever read. The <laughs> ending. <laughs> I, I can kind of understand that given but, the ending. But I told her, I said, but everybody doesn't die. One person just goes insane. Come on. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> In that way, been a maybe lot Bionicle worse. and it aren't too unalike. <laughs> you know what? Actually, if I could ask real quick, uh, mm -hmm. did you have the ending of River of God in mind when you started the book? Uh, I almost never have an ending in mind when I start a book. Um, in that case, though, what I knew going in was that all of the main characters were seeking some form of redemption, and mm -hmm. none of them were going to find it. That the whole idea a lot of was that coming. the idea of redemption coming from the zone was an illusion. And mm -hmm. they really were all doomed before they even got started on this. So I knew it wasn't going to have a happy ending. Yeah. And I don't think that it would have been published if it had a happy ending because the owner of the company I was working for was not into happy endings. So <laughs> that's why actually there's that analogy at the beginning of the book about um, um, crushing the baby's skull in the crib. Because mm -hmm. I knew he'd like that. <laughs> and so when I handed him the first couple of chapters, I put that in there knowing he would fixate on that part and he'd like it. And I would get to keep going. You got to give him All that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one more one more thing I just wanted to mention about the, the Bionicle novels in general. It really is interesting that you had no plans to, or you weren't really working on them at all until Quest for the Masks, because yeah. up until that point, all of Kathy's novels were pretty much just extensions of the comics. And it really does stand as a testament to how bland Bionicle could have ended up if you hadn't gone onto the team. Because from that point onward, practically everything except for the movie novelizations were all original content. It seems very fascinating to me that for a project that you seemingly had almost no input in to begin with, it sort of became very focused around you and how you built it. Well, I mean, with the novels, you usually had maybe three out of the novels out of the year were based on main story, and that was coming out of the, the story team. So I would know, well, we're starting here and we're ending here, but I had a lot of freedom about what I wanted to put in the middle about how we got there. Well, we mm -hmm. knew where it had to start. We knew how, it, how where it had to end. We knew what the MacGuffin was that they were trying to collect, you know, things like that. We, we had that figured out already. But then there were usually at least two novels a year that were just my story. Yeah, um, and that's where your, your creativity really shines, I think. Like Voyage of Fear, Maze of Shadows, um, Legacy of I'm Evil. Proud. Those are some of my favorite books, personally. Yeah, I mean, my my personal, I, I liked I liked um, the Darkness Below a lot, um, mm -hmm. and I like Time Trap a lot. Those are the ones that really stick in my head. The best I think way. Legacy of Evil is Leg Legacy of Evil is my personal favorite. I actually did an art project a few years ago where I actually transcribed the entire book into a vector of Zoktan. The, so it was just like it looked like he was still made of protodytes, but if you look really closely at the poster, it's just the entire book in his form. Oh wow! It's a refer. It was a reference to a B movie meme. Yeah, that is true. Actually, <laughs> thank you for breaking the, that down, Josie. And <laughs> the, the old meme where people printed out the B movie script on a T-shirt is like, I can probably do that better. <laughs> <laughs> The joke is that people really like the B movie. You got Josie's any on very the B good movie, at Greg? removing any illusion of depth. <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen the B movie, Greg? I don't think so. You're not missing out on much. <laughs> it's, it's a movie. Just, it's just like an extended episode of Seinfeld, but animated. That's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay then. Uh, so right, I think we should probably um, yeah m move ahead in the story slightly to uh, 2002. Mm -hmm. So of course this is the introduction of the uh, the Borok and the Toa Nuva, and um, you know so, sort of 
starting to introduce some more sci-fi elements in general to Bionicle. Um, so I was wondering, in, uh, as along it was those lines, at this point, very early on, just project bugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was wondering the the slow shift towards more sci-fi stuff. Um, was that a, a story team mandated thing, or was that something that you approached them with? Oh no, that all came from them. Okay. Hmm. Um, I was not. I was not at that point in any kind of a position to be able to going to go. Let's go do this. You know, this was right. this was that was all planned ahead by Bob. Bob had what he called the seven books of Bionicle in his head, <laughs> and and this was part of one of his books of Bionicle. Okay. I'm curious what else he had in mind for that. Like, from what I recall from at least Alistair's story, is that it was originally just a three-year plan, like the way G2 was eventually planned out. I'm guessing that each year had its own unique setting in that, right? Well, the interesting thing, though, is that I recall the scramble to come up with a product for the beginning of 2003. So... Right. If the plan was for three years, I don't know why they would have been scrambling like that. Um, that is odd. Um, because, I mean, the call were obviously just, we don't have anything ready, you know. Right. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if they had it set for three years or not. I, I, I think that they were planning for basically one year until they saw what the sales were. Mm -hmm. um, because there was a lot of obviously there was a lot of money and a lot of um, effort put into promoting it uh, when it came out in 2001 there was a lot of commitment to it but nobody knew if it was going to sell because it wasn't traditional Lego building so now that really was probably Lego's biggest leap of faith in a long time yeah it was I mean um, I kind of wish I'd been here when they were talking the company into it but <laughs> um you know, there was a lot of excitement about it. Uh, they had a lot of different people in different departments that were involved with it. Um, so there was a real company-wide push behind it. But no, mm. nobody knew until it came out whether it was going to do well or not. And I remember so when, we, uh, when the first comic came out, we had a lot of people quit the club because they said we were promoting a religion. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's that's actually quite funny. <laughs> and it is the best religion but, uh, ever. But not really uncommon for that point in time, really. Like, you hear a lot of similar things about Harry Potter from that point in time. That's true. So, yeah, Greg, so will you... Was, oh, um, never mind. Go on. It's okay. Um, the, the biggest thing with the Borok that I remember is they were really hard to write for because they didn't have any personality. Mm -hmm. Um. And and by the time we well the call had the call had more because there were fewer of them but um, you know coming on top of the Rahi it was getting kind of hard to keep writing for essentially faceless masses of enemies um, mm. and at least in the case of the Rahi it was always possible to to use Makuta as sort of a writing escape goat and yeah. project his personality through them. For the bull yeah. rock, you don't even have that. No. No. <laughs> and I mean it was it was basically lineage in versus the ants was what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So Greg, were you uh, obviously you were on board uh, in your capacity as an author for most of this, but um it sounds like were you <laughs> specifically brought on for Bionicle or were you more just an attachment to Lego? No, I was uh, like I said, I was hired to write the magazine I was hired to write the club magazine because they didn't have a uh, the writer they were using for it was a freelancer and they wanted to bring somebody in on staff to do the magazine Right, uh, the, yeah, I, the Lego I, club magazine I, yeah. I stumbled on the Bionicle, I mean I could very easily have not been doing the comic and if I didn't do the comic I wouldn't have done the books uh, Bionicle was always something extra on top of my regular job what an interesting way that would have turned out if that hadn't happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's interesting to think of how it would have turned out if you'd had more involved, especially from the beginning. Hmm. Well, I mean, there are things that might have been done differently uh, or done in a different way. I mean, um, I, was, I was very concerned with the fact that we were doing a thousand-year flashback right in the middle, <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> a lot of kids got confused by that. 
um, mm-hmm. and thought Chiraga turned into Toa, and you know it was just it was kind of a mess. Um, I remember then, I was apparently one of those kids, but for the next, I just assumed that when you got out of the flashback, that we were still in the flashback. So I thought 2006 flashback, and it was <laughs> like. I was like, oh, so now the Matoran are to- so now the Matoran used to be Toa. Well, that was the original plan was gonna be present day flashback, present day flashback, present day flashback. That was the original idea for the structure. Right. Just keep them right. then, on, um, over and over again into into more and more flashback. By the time that <laughs> 2006 rolled around, I don't remember if Bob was gone at that point or going at that point, but uh, I don't think he was really involved anymore, so that whole flashback thing went out the window. It was like okay. you came up to the plate and it's like, yeah, that thing we've been doing for the last two years, I'm sick of this. We're done. <laughs> well, and originally, if I recall correctly, I don't remember if 2005 was originally supposed to be part of the flashback. I know hmm. that uh, when we were planning for 05, um, there was some talk about doing something else. I don't really recall what it was. And we got pushback saying so much time and so much money was put into designing Metro Nui that we really needed to do Metro Nui for another year. Right, yeah. That makes a lot of sense, actually, because uh, the ending of the second movie, um, you know, it was set in Metro Nui, of course, that ends on a very final note. It's like, you know, the, the Toa Metro do bring all the Matora into the island and they uh, free all of them. And then in 2005, then, they go back to Metro Nui and actually go rescue the rest of them. Yeah, so we basically were doing a flashback between two scenes of the movie. Mm, yeah. 2005, mm. Which was really confusing. <laughs> yeah, um, I know I was confused by that as a kid. Yeah, so, you know, that that was a case of we had to keep using the city. Mm. And um, and so we had to come up with a story that then was going to work in that city again. Right. I, I know okay. I should wait for the 2005 part of the recording before I mention this, but I guess, you know, it, I'll lose my train of thought. It, I do remember at one point the script writers for Web of Shadows were trying to make it sort of like a Rock'em Sock'em Robots kind of thing. And you had to come in and basically redo the entire script. Oh, me? Yeah, I I that's what I, I was told. I didn't that. work on the 2005 movie script at all. The only movie mm-hmm. I was involved in doing any writing for was I did the screen treatment for the 2009 movie. But mm-hmm. I never had any. I had never had anything to do with the scripts of the movies other than doing the novelizations. That reminds me, Curtis. We mm-hmm. need to do another another bonus episode. You know why? We forgot something. What, what we forgot forget? Greg's script. For the Legend Reborn sequel. Oh, of course, right. yeah. Yeah, we do have to talk about that sometime. Mm. Uh, well, we could briefly go over it now. Um, not, you know, in depth or anything, but... Um, mm. Yeah, oh. so so that planned sequel for the Legend Reborn, um, of course it was going to involve, uh, going to involve robot dinosaurs and um, the Valley of the Maze and uh, a few new characters as well. Um, uh, how did it feel, like, sort of, when that was uh, cancelled on you? Oh, I mean, I, well, I mean, first of all, that was that was my idea. It hadn't been approved by anybody yet. So I have no idea if that's what the movie would have ended up being. Right, but okay. um, no, I mean, I was broken hearted about Bionicle getting canceled. I was, you know, I don't think I slept for three or four days after that. Um, you know, it, it, it was uh, it was uh, it was devastating because it was so unexpected. We were in Billund to have a story meeting to plan 2010. And that's when they told us. And then the next day they were like, okay, come up with what we're going to do instead. What, what is going to be the successor to this? And, Mm -hmm. um, and I was just like, you know, I just couldn't believe it because we had a three movie deal at that point. And I I couldn't believe that they were walking away from that, but. Yeah. Yeah, That, that was an interesting case too, because I remember that through me three movie deal being mentioned. And I remember after Bionicle was canceled, it just so happened that they announced a Hero Factory TV series that just so happened to be made by the same studio. So it seems like they renegotiated that deal and converted the last two movies into a TV series to fulfill it. That made so many people mad. So Mm -hmm. many. Anyways, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here. We're right on 2002 at the moment, aren't we? I suppose so, yeah. 
<laughs> the hell I'm behind, you could say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, on, on the subject of 2002, and um, Energized Protodermis, of course, was uh, introduced at that time, um, or I, I think before you did the uh, novelization for, um, uh, what's it called, the uh, Beware the Barock, I, I think. Um, before you did that novel, uh, it was just referred to as Mercury in the um, uh, in Mask of Light, I think. I might be getting my timeline mixed up, but the point is, um, Energized Protodermis. We only ever see it in liquid form, and I was wondering, uh, how would that act in, you know, could it have a solid form or a gaseous form, and would those work the same way? Yeah, we've had a few discussions on here about that. Hmm. Well, I believe we've only ever shown Energized Protodermis in liquid form. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, obviously we've had liquid protodermis, solid protodermis, because everything's made out of protodermis. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, I'm not sure if energized protodermis can exist in any other state. I, I don't recall ever seeing anything in a story bible about that. Right, okay. Uh, all right then, uh, in that case, uh, yeah, so the tone over transform, uh, well, they transform into the tone over, rather, and, um, you know, they seal the barrack away. And uh, and that's when they're branded with the um, the Nuva symbols, which sort of just sort of came into the story <laughs> out of nowhere. You're using my terminology now. <laughs> yeah. So um. So of course, yeah. Liam and uh, a couple of his friends have been thinking about how exactly the Nuva symbols works and why they exist. Uh, I was wondering if you had any input on that, any insider knowledge. Nope. Fun that's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know if you looked through it, but I sent you a link a few days ago of like what we had planned moving forward, and I was, you know, just kind of curious if you had any plans for the Nuva Cube as well, because that's always something that had never been explained, and our idea for it was we ended up connecting it to the Merendar, so it was sort of the same kind of deal where if a Toa or a Toa team go against an agent of Mata Nui, their powers are sealed into a symbol and they're essentially branded as traitors. But because the Toa Nuva's powers are already sealed, they serve as like a deus ex machina against Merendar because he can't do anything to them now. I have well, to I mean, the only, uh, the only thought I ever had on the cube was that it was basically like a combination lock. Right. Um, that was the way I always saw it. But, um... Yeah, it was something that was in the story bible, and um, they didn't really explain it, so I just went with it. Yeah, yeah. could I enough. potentially jump back a sec to the energized protodermis thing? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so when it's first brought up, uh, if memory serves, in the comic where the the Toa are transformed in the Toa Nuva, it's not called energized protodermis; it's just called protodermis. So at that time, mm -hmm. uh, I guess Metro Nui wasn't necessarily being planned or, or thought of yet. Well, so was the idea of protodermis being something larger and that more things were made of not really a concept yet? And protodermis back then was basically just... I, I do not think it was a concept at that point. Okay, no. so basically energized protodermis was the, the later distinction made to separate it from the protodermis that everything in Metro Nui is made of. Okay. Right. And I think the reason that you only see EP in the liquid state is that the transformation basically requires immersion. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. That does bring up an interesting point, though. Like, what would happen if Energized Protodermis had a gaseous form? Uh, well, that would have been really interesting if you, if you then unleash the gas on an entire population. Mm hmm. And it would have been an interesting foil to Antidermis, which by default existed in a gaseous form. Right. Well, me and Cursus were talking about this, and I had this sort of idea that if liquid protodermis is essentially a huge amount of energy uh, condensed as a liquid, um, if gaseous protodermis were to exist, perhaps it would be, because of the nature of gas, obviously, it's more difficult dispersed it would affect things on a, a slower rate but on a more deep level right. hmm. more fundamental and then of course there's the the lesser used magnetized protodermis which i believe was only ever mentioned as being part of the metronui shoot system 
Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. Of course, that's um, yeah, liquid protodermis that has been uh, magnetized or ionized. or uh, There's a few different um, uh, descriptions <laughs> of it. Um, okay. So, yeah, let's move on to 2003. Of course, the big, uh, the first very big story year, um, potentially planned as an ending to the series, possibly, or um, in general, it was a, a, a big break for Bionicle. Of course, we got our first movie in that year, Mask of Light. Uh, we got mm-hmm. our first big video game as well, that being the uh, Bionicle the game on PS2, GameCube, all sorts of things like that. And um, I'm extra salty about Bionicle the game these days, just because... <laughs> Just because of um, Liam Robertson's research into the subject of Legend of Mata Nui and talking to previous developers, and, you know, as it was turned out, Legend of Mata Nui was cancelled both in part due to management shifts at LEGO at the time, but also Argonaut just caught, sort of waltzed up to LEGO. I was like, here, see that game you're working on? Ours is going to be on all platforms and cover three years. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> screw that last shit we were doing. This is this is this isn't happening. <laughs> well, I can tell you that uh, by the time they were getting into O three, um, they already knew it was coming back in O four. I mean, there were there were rumblings about retailers not wanting it anymore at the beginning of O three because the call were not selling that well, mm. but um. The Bionicle team was already thinking in terms of 04. So, so uh, the main reason I got on to um, fan sites in 03 was because there were all these rumors going around that Mask of Life Bionicle, and I wanted to go on and say, no, it wasn't. Hmm. Okay. That's interesting. Um, yeah, the, the, there were a few times during Bionicle's run where um, you know the, the fans were scared that it might end. Um, of course, 2003 was one of them. Uh, 2005, I, th- I think, uh, towards the end of that, people were thinking, well, where, where do we go from here? The story's wrapped up. And um, and then again in 2008, when you know the Great Spirit was being awakened, of course, that was very quickly resolved. Um, but yeah, it is, it's interesting to see how at each cornerstone of, of Bionicle's development, there was always the, the threat of it potentially ending. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so, so yeah, did to... you... Sorry. Just quickly... Um... So there are a lot of points in the story where it seems like it could have ended and then just suddenly, by chance, had a rejuvenation. So did you have sort of planned endings for those times just in case you never got continuation for it or they go ahead to keep going? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Okay. I had to step away for a few minutes. The squirrels were attacking. Okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> have they stopped attacking? Never. <laughs> Maybe one day. Uh, for now, then, should we move on to um, Mask of Light proper? I suppose that um, that yeah. whole story arc. Uh, you know, of course, um, Takua becoming a you know a major character as Takanova as he later became. Um, well, what do you think of Takua or Takanova in general as a character? Takua. <laughs> uh, ta- um. Well, Takur, I wasn't really that familiar with because he was more of an online character. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was decided early on the comics were not going to deal with the Matoran at all. They were going to focus on the Toa. Right. Um, you know, my major thing with him was I didn't want us to end up in a situation where we had one Toa who was way more powerful than all the other ones. We didn't want to marry Sue. <laughs> well, we didn't want we didn't want Superman in the Justice League where you have to disable him in the first five pages of every story. You know? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> um, but then we so, did it anyway. You know, that <laughs> was that was my concern with him. Um, but, you know, I didn't have any real issue with him. I mean, there was nothing from a story perspective that I had a big problem with. So. That's I'm curious enough. though, how far back was the seventh Toa planned? Because initially, I, I think again, I... this this is something that was in Bob's head probably from the beginning. Mm-hmm. I mean, Which it just wasn't it written down, you know. Right. But I think he had this plan from the beginning. That that does bring up an interesting point, though, because with things had to change when the Legend of Mata Nui was canceled. I hate to keep bringing this up, but um, 
Quest for the Toa, the GBA game they made before that, followed Takua and then immediately transitioned into the Makanui Online game, which was to be being developed incrementally as the year went on. But when Legend of Matanui was cancelled, they had to re they basically had their hand forced to, you know, focus a little more on the Toa and also re reveal the player character as Takua, which was not the original plan. So with that always intended to be to remain ambiguous, it brings up the question as to who the seventh Toa was meant to be originally, if not Takua. No idea. Hmm. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, if, the, if the intent was that you weren't supposed to know who you were playing, that's not something that I was ever told. It's really right. strange to hear how, because of the way that everyone had their own role, everyone did their job, it seems like a lot of people in the team weren't particularly familiar with a lot of the story. Uh, they just had their own section. So, were you sort of particularly broad in your roles and how you ended up building the story? Or was it really just entirely down to chance? Um, well, I mean, it depends on what year you're looking at. You know, if you're looking at the early years, then, uh, you know, th what the story was was coming from Bob. Um, and then after that, in the later years, it was myself and uh, an advance and the set designer and the other members of the team basically batting ideas around and, and building off of each other's ideas pretty much like in any other writer's room. Yeah, I okay. definitely know Christian Faber played a large part, in her, both early on and later on as well. Yep. I apologize, by the way, if I ask anything irrelevant or strange. I, <laughs> I don't know how familiar you are with the podcast itself, but uh, the, essentially the last two decades of your work I've been experiencing only for the last year, so it's a lot for me <laughs> to keep a hold of in my head. He slowly went mad, and then he went to say... <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so yeah actually speaking of this podcast in general um again like like Levi said i don't know how familiar you are with it but um basically what the structure has been up until now is uh every week or two we'd uh, read a section of bionicle we'd go through it in chronological order and um then we you know uh, run basically like a book club meeting about it and um uh, and of course the uh, the version of the books that we've been reading uh was compiled by Turaganuva over here he basically put them all into a, a, a more easily readable format uh, by combining different parts of books together and uh, putting them into an ideal reading order. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's pretty cool. He has a faith. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah, moving on to, uh, I guess, 2004 then. So 2004, of course, is where the um, the story took a major sci-fi turn uh, with the introduction of Metro Nui and the Toa Metro and uh, Vaki and all sorts of things like that. Um, I was wondering, uh, I, I thought I was going to think of a, a question as I was making that sentence, but I haven't thought of one. So has anybody else got a question they'd like to ask? Well done. Uh... I remember, what I remember about 04 was that there was a lot of discussion about which Matoran were going to be the Toa mm, in 04. Okay. There was a lot of back and forth over uh, which ones of the ones that had been introduced were going to end up being the ones that were the Toa. So it okay. wasn't always intended to be a flashback then? No, it was always intended to be a flashback, but the question was was going to be, you know, which Matoran were we going to say had been, had been Toa? Are we going to make up new ones or what? Okay, so, so, so the plan wasn't really always for the... the... Sorry. Oh, I was just going to ask, how did it ultimately come down to the decision of the Turaga having once been Toa? Uh, I think that probably came from Bob. Hmm. hmm. He made good decisions sometimes. <laughs> it, it does seem like, yeah, a lot of um, a lot of the good that came out of early Bionicle was, was down to him. Um, so, yeah, definitely props where it's due. Um, so, yeah, 2004 then. Uh, so the, um, 
the introduction of uh, Tragaduma and the Vaki, of course, um, something of a police state, I think it's fair to describe <laughs> Metro Nui as. Uh, we were in- inspired at all by, um, you know, uh, uh, stories of, um, well, uh, I-, I guess, various political stories. 1984. Going into that. Uh, I don't really know, because it wasn't my story. Yeah, you know what, fair enough. I, I guess a lot of that would have been yeah, decided in the um, uh, by other people in the story team. Um, so, uh, I suppose in in a uh, I don't know. So sort of going going along those lines, then, um, were there any stories or plot threads that you wanted to write and you pitched to the story team, and um, either they or Lego shot them down? No, no. So, no, so you, I, 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 at the time that I was really not that heavily involved in the team, besides being in meetings for the sake of awareness of what was going on, uh, I really wasn't in a position to, to pitch stories at them. Uh, right, by the okay. time I was being brought in, the story was already decided. Right, okay. Uh, all right, then. Uh, so, yeah, the uh, story of 2004, then. So, of course, that comprised uh, a lot of different uh, sort of sub-stories. We had the uh, the collection of the Great Discs. We had the... Um, the Toa on the run from the Vaki. We had the Kraka subplot. Um, all sorts of different things. Um, do you have a particular and favorite? The garden, was... And the gardening exploits of the Wii. <laughs> yeah, taking out the more Buzak. Um, yeah, do you have any, any particular uh, favorites out of those st- mini story arcs? Well, I mean, um, I like the more Buzak story because it was mine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, a lot of 2004 I have a soft spot for because those were really the first books that I was doing. Right, of course. It is yeah. a shame that more of the the original 2004 material didn't make it into the movie because all of that was just summed up in a collection montage for the great discs. And the most you ever see of the Morbuzak is that one camera cut with Fakama hanging upside down. Yeah, well, we had, I mean, we had the movie. And we knew, obviously, that was going to be a big deal, but that was second half of the year. We needed a first mm-hmm. half of the year storyline. And, um, uh, and you know, because we couldn't tell movie story in the comics right. uh, ahead of time or the books. So that's where the Morbizot came from, is that I needed, I, needed a, I needed an antagonist for the books. It was quite okay. surprising for me, actually, because... A lot of that arc seemed to be building up the Mobazak as sort of a final boss for the arc, and then it just kind of disappeared yeah. almost. It was very well, I think it felt up. more like it was one of those things where it's an evil, but it it only serves to remind you that there's a bigger evil pulling the strings. Yeah, well, I've always liked that kind of thing. Mm. I mean, years later, when I ended up doing my rewrite of, of Makuda, which was probably the other major contribution I made, um, you know, uh, that was part of my thinking, was that there's a lot of stuff he's behind mm-hmm. that you just don't know about. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. You know, he, he's, he's pretty much a master of diversion. Uh, so, yeah, actually, going off of something you said there, um, you said, you know, you, you had the, um, the the movie planned out and then you went back and made the, the first half of the year's story. Uh, right. So, uh, so is it that the, um, the, the montage of the Toa collecting the Great Discs, was that originally just supposed to be that short segment and then you expanded it into the books, or was it always planned to be a, a bigger part of the story than the movie made it out to be? Well, the thing was, we knew that there was going to be these Great Discs involved somehow because that was mentioned that they existed but when we came down to what the heck is the story for the first half of the year going to be that's where that idea that quest came from was we had to have something to do for the first eight months of the year Hmm. okay uh, cool. I, I, I also wanted to ask too would you you said you really enjoyed writing the more booze doc Mm-hmm. How difficult was that compared to writing the Bullrock? Because the Morbuzak did technically have a personality, but you only really got to it once you had to write the King Root as a character. Right, but it was it was I actually found it much easier to do the Morbuzak. Um because mm. the with the Bullrock, it was sort of like 
they were all doing the same thing. They all had the same reason for it. They it was like writing about a tornado, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it was totally impersonal. They weren't evil. They were just doing what they were supposed to do. They were just doing it at the wrong time, you know. Whereas the Morbizak was just not a nice thing. <laughs> and um, you know, you could draw on Day of the Triffids. You could draw on all sorts of stuff like that. So. Liam, I love the Day of the Triffids. That was a really good book. <laughs> um, and that uh, actually, yeah, yeah. You, sorry, you mentioned there that um, you know, that, of course, the Borok were just you know just doing their job at the wrong time. Uh, how far ahead was was that whole you know thing planned in advance that the Borok were, uh, you know, uh, agents of Matanui essentially? Was that planned from the beginning? Oh, well, I mean, that was that was known when the Bible for two thousand two was written. It right. was always I, I, I was they were not evil. Yeah, I, I I could have mentioned that too. I remember um, Christian Faber uploaded a bunch of things up onto his blog years and years ago, the Faber Files, and he has some original artwork dictating the evolution process or an early evolution process of the Matoran, the Toa, the Turaga, and then the other side is the Borok, and then some other evolutions of the Borok that never made it off the cutting room floor. Quite interesting. Um, yeah. All right then. Uh, so yeah, actually, um, going quickly back to the, um, you, you said that uh, there was some debate inside the story team of what the uh, what Matoran or you know eventually Turaga were going to become the Toa of two thousand four. Uh, is it that um, so l- later on in in Time Trap, I believe, um, you uh, you sort of mentioned how. Uh, there was um, there was some confusion within the story about who you know who was meant to be the Toa, and how perhaps the Matoran who found the great discs could have been those Toa. Uh, was that like a little um, a little in joke about the internal um, story discussions about that? Well, yeah, and I also wanted to just throw a little uncertainty into it, you know, mm. um, because at the end of the day. If you're if you're basing everything off of essentially the the stars, which was the electrical energy of Matanui's brain, hmm. if you could alter his brain patterns, then you could make the prophecy whatever you wanted it to be. Yeah, yeah. That okay, that's cool. another interesting point I, I wanted to mention. Um, again, something that I may be getting a little ahead of myself, but also maybe not because we did talk about two thousand three, um, when Jala was resurrected. Uh, somebody mentioned, uh, I don't remember if you mentioned this once before in a topic or something, but it was, to, it's to my understanding that Jala was resurrected from residual energy within his mask, correct? I think that's what the story was, yeah. Okay, so when it came time to write the true purpose of the Red Star, was there any intention then to have a duplicate of Jala sitting up there? No. Hmm. Because I feel like the, the, that's another thing I wanted to explore in my own sort of continuation is that it was sort of like a stolen destiny timeline where plot line where up on the red star, Jala was resurrected on the ground from his mask. But when he was also resurrected on the star, he didn't come back until later only to find out this other guy has stolen his destiny, and I feel like that would have been really interesting to explore. I think there was a case of, because he was brought back so quickly in the movie, there wasn't, it wouldn't have been time to duplicate him on the star. Right. So hmm. it takes time for things to get up there, does it? Well, yeah, it's a bureaucracy. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, so yeah, okay. So the um, so wrapping up two thousand four, then um, of course that wrapped up with a a fight against the Was it, was it, enti- uh, was it entirely your idea for Vakamas Frisbee Launcher to work like a jetpack? <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with that. That would have been set design. Okay. Uh, okay. Cause, because because I, I don't think that was ever actually advertised in the sets. Um. He doesn't. He doesn't do that in the movie, but he does do it in your comic and your book. Well, hmm. it probably was listed in the Bible as something he could do, because hmm. it's not something I would have done on my own. Right. Yeah. 
I wonder when. I wonder why then the uh, the movie writers never took advantage of that because that could have been uh, used to great effect. Hmm. I think they probably just didn't want to detract from Madhouse shenanigans. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, it's also possible too. It's also it's also possible that um, that that was something that was decided on as far as the functionality goes after the movie was already written. Right. Okay. Could be, could be. Uh, yeah, okay, so uh, so yeah, 2004 wraps up with a fight against Makuta, of course, um, Vakama discovering his mask power uh, at the same time as using the Mask of Time, um, you know, for, the, for the, uh, the second time we'd seen it in the story, but the first time chronologically. Um, so I, I was wondering, regarding the Mask of Time, uh, actually, uh, we wanted to bring this up, is could that be related in any way to um, Vakama's visions of the future that he gets throughout the story? Because, um, Josie, you had an idea of uh, perhaps because he'd used the Mask of Time, it retroactively affected him in the past and gave him visions of the future. Uh, so, Greg, I was wondering if you had any input on that. Uh, I don't, actually, because the, um, the visions of the future were never explained in the Bible. Really? They, okay. never, they never explained why he was able to do that. Hmm. Okay. So my explanation is the only one there is. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we can leave that one up to fan interpretation. I <laughs> win. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, another point I wanted to bring up, too, is um, I'm curious how what kind of material other than the Bible did you have to work with when you were writing these things? Because I noticed in particularly a lot of the comics, especially in 2004, it's very clear that the artist, Randy Elliott, only had the prototypes to work with because the designs he used were based on the prototype versions of the sets where the Toa Metru lacked their chest plates. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was I suppose, curious, like, how, yeah. how early you ended up doing these things. And well, if I mean, anything, the thing is, you're you talking know, about... Change. You're talking about a magazine, so you're talking about the January issue of the magazine would have been put to bed July of the year before. Wow. Because oh, okay. uh, we usually had about a six-month lead time. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we're just, we're just finishing off right now. We're finishing off the March 2020 issue. Right. Okay. Uh, so we were always working way, way, way ahead. And it always was an issue to get images or models or something for the artist to work from. Mm -hmm. okay. But we had the same issue. We had the same issue with the magazine not proper in January because we didn't always have um, the new sets to work with when we were trying to put articles and puzzles and stuff together. Right, okay. Um, so, okay, moving on to... Uh... Uh, I suppose the the Voyage of Fear arc, you know, you know the the journey back to um to Metro Nui after they'd uh, initially gone to Mata Nui, and uh, and then two thousand five proper. Um, so yeah, of course this was uh, a, another sort of uh, uh, shift in in story tone. This time to a much more horror focused, uh, darker, edgier kind of story. Um, which seemed to be a a, a very prevalent thing in the mid two thousands. A lot of franchises were going dark and edgy. Um. I'm sure you're aware of um, uh, the Shadow of the Hedgehog, the video game that came out around that time. Um, th there's a lot of parallels what if to be Sonic, made. What if Sonic, but with good? <laughs> <laughs> what if Bionicles, but with teeth? You know. <laughs> um, so yeah, does anybody here have uh, any partic anything particular to ask about 2005? Well, there is always that idea that Matau was originally supposed to be the traitor. I'm curious uh, what... No, the, the, the Matau was not originally supposed to be the traitor. Vakama was always the traitor, but there were a lot of us who didn't feel that Vakama should be the traitor. Right. Uh, I can remember very clearly being on the phone with the web producer and Bob arguing vociferously against Vakama being the traitor. Um... <laughs> And we all felt Matau made more sense because Matau was more of a narcissist. Mm -hmm. And so getting mutated into a monstrous form would be a lot more likely to affect him and yeah, make well, him mm -hmm. corrupt than it would be to affect Vakama, who was the guy who was the most 
the most um, into being a Toa. Mm -hmm. It never made any sense. And what we got it back was, well, this is the hero's journey and this is part of the hero's journey. And I'm like, but it doesn't make any sense. (laughs) You know, it doesn't make any sense that even if he felt he failed, he's not going to go over to the other side. You know, I always I never got over that. And to me, that destroyed the suspension of disbelief in that story. And I suppose that's where you ultimately had to write it. You had to write his inner monologue as right. this is the best way to help the Matoran. Right. Because you I really had, didn't to want him to with, do that. I, I, when I did the movie novelization, I had to find some way to make his his actions make sense. Mm-hmm. Because because um, they didn't. Uh, yeah. And to me, that was a case of moving a, a character like a chess piece in a story instead of going based on who the character was and what the character would actually do. Right. Made yeah. the best of it. Um, it was, it was forcing, it was forcing the character to behave the way you wanted him to behave because that's what you wanted the story to be. But mm. it did not ring true. I didn't think. Yeah. Sometimes mm. you have to let go of when you're writing a story or really when you're doing any sort of project, you have to let go of what, you planned to go with what feels right at the time. It, it seems like that's that dictated a lot of how you write. The, I mean, I think it would have it would have planned. worked. It would have worked if you had set him up as I don't want to be a Toa. I right. don't want this responsibility. I don't want this pressure. I don't want to have to do this. And then flipping the way he flipped would make sense because then you don't have the responsibility anymore. You're just doing what somebody else tells you to do. But that That was not the way he was set up. He was set up to be a hero worshipping Matoran who loved being a Toa. That brings up an interesting way that he was characterized too because in a lot of like early work in 2004 with the comics and your writing, he was characterized as a lot more confident than the movie made him out to be. Now, was there yeah. any like dis- disconnect between you and the writers of the movie, or well, the was thing is, it? I I had no input on the writing of the movie, and they could read what I was writing or not read what I was writing, and I right. have no idea if they were reading what I was writing. So, mm. um, but yeah, I mean, other than sitting in meetings in California while they talked about the movie, I didn't have anything to do with anything. So, um. You know, they they went off and they were going to do it the way it worked best for the movie. Yeah, the the way Vakama the the way Vakama does turn, it's it stands out to me quite a bit because I remember when we were reading this and we have Draganuva for to thank for putting everything in chronological order, and I remember mentioning to him because of the way it's cut up, there was a stark gap between the end of your book and the beginning of the novelization of the movie, which we sort of cut out a fair amount of the beginning of it because it was just a rehash of the beginning of what you had already written in books prior, like Web of the Viserac. Mm -hmm. And so it went from they're all celebrating their victory at the Tower of Toa to Vakama brooding on his little walk. <laughs> and it was really stark. I, I don't know what else to say about that. It's just, it was very clear that you and the people on the movie wanted to write very, very different things. Yeah, it feels like the movies are almost a parallel canon then with the disconnect between the story team and the movie team. Mm. Um, yeah, actually, that's, uh, that's a fair point, is that... Um... Uh, the uh, the eighth adventures book. Um, I forget what it was called, but um, it, it essentially left itself off um, just right in the middle of the two thousand five story, and then the movie comes along and and snap you back to the beginning again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, challenge the of the Hordeka, I think it was. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I was wondering, like, it. I guess since the other books um, so neatly sort of um, flow from you know one book to the next. Uh, how how was it with the uh, novelization of movie three? That um, uh, you know, how did it come to be that you ended up having to 
you know, go back and, and rehash previous parts of the story um, and not just make a continuous narrative? Um, well, I mean, the thing is, when you're doing a movie novelization, you're just going based on the script you've got. Mm. So if the script was doing rehash at the beginning, then the novelization had to do rehash in the beginning. I suppose so. The same yeah. way that I could do, I could give Vakama thoughts. I could give him thoughts in the novelization that weren't reflected in the movie, but I could not change his dialogue. Mm. Right. Okay. And it's there is always the thing that there is always the idea as well that whenever you're writing a book like that, there it, it is often based on early revisions of the script. One it good is. example it's very being rarely the mask based of, on what the final script would be. The Mask of Light novelization is a good example of this because the scene where Jala is asking Takua to use his new Kohli move in the Kohli match, in the book, he starts to mention, like, it only works in practice. But in the movie, he says that's what the audience came for. However, if you watch the deleted scenes from Mask of Light, you can see that that scene was originally supposed to go just like the book had it. Uh, so, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, we're wrapping up 2005 then, because we've been going for a little while on that. Uh, should we yeah. get into uh, 2006 then? Um, of course, the Roy um, story, the Paraka. <laughs> <laughs> the smiley uh, yeah. boy. <laughs> mm. The uh, very, very menacing Paraka, of course. Um, the all-American rejects tie in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, something real quick I just wanted to mention about the about the Paraka is um, how the, the... Of course, they are part of the Skakti species, and... Um, in earlier books for 2006, their species was never named. It was only much later on, around the fourth or fifth book of the 2006-2007 story, that um, they were actually named as Skakti. I was wondering, was that something that um, you just didn't have a, a name prepared for their species? Um, because they were, all, they were always referred to as Paraka. I don't really recall. Okay. That's fine. Um... So, yeah, going back on to, yes, yeah, so it's more about uh, 2006 then. Let's have a look. Um, doo -doo -doo. I'm just scrolling through the uh, the Ooh. questions here that, that Josie's prepared, um, by the way. Can I ask something real uh, quick while you look through that? Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So, was there, to your knowledge, like a sort of an intentional, intentional or conscious tonal shift in 06 for the brand as a whole? Like, was there a, an, an intentional sort of change in like the marketing and and the the tone of the story and stuff because i i uh well i mean there there certainly was a lot of marketing input on that story because all the nicknames for the paraco all that stuff came from marketing hmm. okay when they were uh, giving them all like like soccer player names and stuff like that yeah <laughs> that all came from marketing that didn't that wasn't Storytelling. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's sort of part of why I was asking is because the sort of the advertising around the Paraka and even the Anika felt so sort of distinct from stuff that had come before. Yeah, it's funny too. The Anika also have those nicknames, but they're only used in a select few places. I don't even remember where they were actually used. Yeah, I don't uh, think I ever used them. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I think it was in some uh, uh, some cheap card game uh, that got made or something. It, it was either in the card game or the style guide. Right. Okay. Mm. And, uh, and actually, re referring to those nicknames, um, Liam, you wrote down somewhere that uh, apparently Hakan's nickname is the only one that's not mentioned in the uh, Makuta's Guide to the Universe. I, d I wrote that down? Apparently. I don't think I ever I, wrote that down. Yeah, I haven't you... even read Makuta's Guide to the Universe. I I wrote it down. I listed it as coming from him because it was a question he voiced in the in the podcast. Okay. Uh, I did. Uh, yeah, I I mentioned that it was that I it was uh not in the thing and then you asked, "Well, if it's apparently not canon, then what is his, his gangster nickname?" I don't remember that at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I re-listened to the whole podcast. I wanted us to be prepared. All right, let's, <laughs> let, let's, let, let's flip this question on its head then. So, uh, okay, Greg, if, you know, hypothetically, the bully was not Hakan's nickname, and you had to make up a new one for him on the spot, what would it be? 
Oh, I hated those nicknames. I, 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 would, I, would, I, would, I was never going to get involved in those nicknames. So. <laughs> okay. So you'd have them all obliterated. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. It's funny too because they kept going well into 2007 with the Baraki, That's but at true, least yeah. those ones made more tangible well, sense guess, to their I character. Just, I just felt like, who would know these names? Yeah, you know? I mean the Paraka are going to go tell the Matoran what those names are. So who would know <laughs> them besides the Paraka? So why would they ever come up? Hi, I'm Toa Hakan, but you can call me the bully. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> I know, it, it was never gonna, there was no way to get them in the story, so I just ignored them. I interpreted mm. them as being like the the dark hunters all had uh, these generic verbs and nouns as names. I interpreted those as code names, and the ver- and right. the Baraka- the Proxas marketing names were their Dark Hunter names. And when they stopped, and when they quit the Dark Hunters, they were like, these names are stupid. Let's go back back to what were names were before. That that brings up an interesting point though. If a lot of what the Paraka were being publicly advertised as did come from marketing, I remember a lot of the marketing indicated like they they had this wanted sign with Teradax and it's like the leader of the Paraka gang. And I'm curious if it was always intended that Teradax was supposed to send them to Voyanui or was that something you had to write off of based on what the marketing team came up with? Um, let me think. If I recall correctly, um, I think there always was uh, assumed that there was going to be some connection between uh, Teradax and the Paraka, because by the mm. time we were planning 06, um, I don't think Bob was really around anymore at that point. So mm-hmm. um, it was more of everybody was sort of contributing to the to the whole thing, and we knew that we were going to do a three year arc uh, built around the Mask of Life. Mm-hmm. Um, we did not know at that point that we were going to end it with Mata Nui waking up. Right. Um, okay. That we did not know. But um, but we knew it was going to all have something to do with Teradax trying to get his hands on this thing. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it would make sense that we knew that he had some connection. Right. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Speaking about the Dark Hunters, uh, you know, quickly then. Um, you know, Josie brought up the idea that um, you know, their their generic adjective and verb names that they have, like you know, destroyer or uh, darkness, you know, names like Devastator that. Devastator was a big boy. Devastator, for example, <laughs> the famous big boy. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, are those just code names, or are they their their actual names? Oh no, I think we always did see them as code names, but they also came from the fact that they were fan built creations. Of course, yeah, yeah and these were nice. the names that the fans gave them. That that oh. brings up another point that um, people have probably asked you before, but I'm going to come out with it anyways because it's going to be a thing that's got to be asked. What <laughs> were you planning on naming the Shadowed One? <laughs> oh, that was so many years ago. I don't even remember. <laughs> Would it? It wouldn't happen to be a name that got reused later in a different theme, would it? No. <laughs> That's almost no, fitting. No, His name no was lost to the ages. Were, no names that were approved for use in Bionicle ever got used for any other theme. Okay. Mm. We we came up with as a joke, what if it was Garmadon? No. And we, <laughs> and we were gonna ask you, and then we and then we were like, No, Whoa, no, what if you... no, 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 no. <laughs> nah, no, there was a very by the time Bionicle ended, there was a very, very short list of names that were still approved. And um, and I used them all up in the serials, so right. there were no approved names for Bionicle that got used for anything else. The other thing is, even if there had been, that last that last list of names probably would have been compiled in '09, mm-hmm. so it might not still have been valid by the time Ninjago came out. 
This and it probably to me. wouldn't even. You can't, can't use a two-year-old list because you don't know what other names have been used by other companies in that two years. You have to put a new list together. And okay. given that the list was created for 2009, a lot of the names in that year took a tonal shift into more Latin style names, and that really yeah. wouldn't have fit the shadowed one. Yeah. That actually brings up another point, oh. though. That it is really interesting, the approval process that these have to go through and how strongly they have to be vetted. Because I remember once Legend of Matanui came out, people started asking you to canonize Nobua, and you pretty well had to tell them, no, we can't do that because the name hasn't passed any, that yeah. hasn't passed any checks at Lego. Yeah, anything, anything that we did had to go through the legal team, had to go through um, uh, name checks. And um, yeah, and, and so anything, we, we would send out a list and we would usually lose about a third of the names that wow. were on the list wow. that would get rejected because they were trademarked for somebody or they meant something in a foreign language that we couldn't use them because of that. They right. got um, some serious trouble over that. And that, that really would have been probably a very, how do I put this? The incident with the Maori probably had a huge influence on doing that. I'm sure it because, did. Mm. But but it's also pretty standard business practice. If you're going to put out a toy line internationally, you can't risk naming something that's going to be a bad word in another language. Right. And, you know, you can Google and, you know, you can, can do all that stuff before you submit a name. But... There still might be somebody owns it that just hasn't used it, but they own it anyway, and or it's the name of a company somewhere or something like that. Mm -hmm. You just never know. Especially since back then you didn't really have the the usefulness of Google there to just simply search if something was available. You'd have to go through a huge process to okay something like that. Yeah, so every year we would submit a new list of names, and, and that would be the list of names we had to work for for the year. Hmm, okay. So that would explain the Dark Hunters then, because it wasn't so much, it was both because they were fan creations, but also there were so freaking many of them that to make a list and populate that list with things you could use would be an absolute nightmare. Yeah, and the other thing was you didn't want to spend the money on a legal check for characters you didn't even know if you were going to end up using outside of that book. Right. It's, so. us, yeah. it's really interesting to me to hear the technical aspect to story writing. Because mm -hmm. as a reader, it's really easy to get wrapped up in what's happening in the story itself. You get swept away by events, and characters, but there's a lot of decision making that has to go behind even the smallest aspect to a story like this. Um. So yeah. Okay. Uh. I guess uh, onto you know, uh, the rest of 2006 proper. Then um, you know the uh, the the fight to obtain the Mask of Life, of course, um, inside the volcano. The introduction of uh, Vazon, who, uh, to, to my understanding, is probably your favorite character to write. I think you said oh, at some I point. Love Vazon. Yeah, Vazon was one of my favorites. Yeah. But I always had a, I always had a soft spot for any character that I basically created. I mean, Vazon was was I believe was going to be in the story anyway, but I pretty much was the one who came up with the fact that he was an utter lunatic. Um, it's the kind of character that you could express the kind of things that you did in your previous work. Yeah. Hmm. And he could be yeah, an well, agent I, of I chaos always as well. I joke that, uh, that the thing I missed from my old books was the body count. <laughs> <laughs> well, that explains 2006 onward. <laughs> no, I, mean, guys, uh, I uh, told you. Told you, guys. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, in my first in my first three novels pre Lego, the bodies were just stacked like cordwood. So you know, uh, uh, I seem to remember a really distinct line from one of the first two thousand six novels was, I think it was Zaktan talking to one of the other Paraka about a Toa of plasma that he pretty much melted. Yes, <laughs> that was something you didn't really hear in the story prior to this point. Well, the thing was. I think 2006 was the first year, if I'm remembering correctly, that the Tower were allowed to hit anybody. Yeah, right, I was just yeah. going to bring up their nonviolent policy. Everything had to be indirect. Mm -hmm. They could never strike anyone. 
uh, everything had to be, it was mostly the elemental powers and it was almost all indirect. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, of course then the, um, the Toei Nika, they, uh, they do beat Vazon and his magical transforming spider that turns into a dragon. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of want to see, now I kind of want to see Cardass have a magical girl transformation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe if you commission me to do that, I'll uh, do some like that. <laughs> but um, anyway, then moving on to I guess 2007. Then the uh, the Mask of Life, all on a, a will of its own, um, goes underwater. Well, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the the cancelled book. That is true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Of course, the cancelled Bionicle Legend Seven Invasion, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, which was supposed to detail the the Toa's journey down the cord into uh, and the one where Mario Matoro Wii. gets mind jacked for once. <laughs> um. So yeah, actually, uh, I believe. Um. Uh. uh sorry, uh, Traganuva, was it you that recovered the um? Oh no, no, that, that was that? that was all James. No, it's you. It was James. Right, James. Yeah, of course. Um, Wall of history, man. Yes. Yeah, hmm. he, he recovered the um. Uh, the I, I believe the prologue chapter. To that book, which uh, which you Greg released to um, BZ Power back in the yeah. day, I believe yeah. recently he recovered a bit more of it, but there are still some gaps. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, How so much yeah, I was of that how... book was written by the time it was canceled? No, it wasn't. It hmm. was started. Okay. Right. It was well, started. What did you have? It was not, it was not completely written. Hmm. Did you have any solid plans for that, or were you just working as you went? Um, no, I mean, the most fun with these things was basically to go in and go, uh, let me just see where this adventure goes. Right. Well, I mean, when I wrote the book that, um, that Karzani first shows up in, he was not even planning to be in the book when I started writing the book. I just came up with him. Hmm. Right. That's how I write. I mean, unless it's a case of, I have to stick to a story Bible. I have to tell this main story. I never know where my books are going to go when I start writing them, because if I know, it's like watching a movie a second time when you've seen it already. Right. I would get I bored always... and I want to do a good job on it. it I, I, I like I like when my characters in a are in a death trap, I'm just as panicked as they are because I have no idea how I'm getting them out of it. <laughs> it's less you're writing a character based on things that you're lit, that you're being told or you want to do, and more like what would this character do? Well, yeah. I mean, and there are a lot of writers who work like that who will tell you that what you do is you establish your characters and then you let them tell you the story. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I prefer to work. I mean, if you get stuck, you get stuck for longer um, because, you know, you don't have an outline written. But I've tried writing outlines, and my writing sucks when I write outlines <laughs> because I'm bored and it comes through that I'm bored. And the other thing is, an outline becomes a crutch and you're like, okay, well, this is what happens next. And this is what happens next. And inspiration going in a different direction, doing some other scene is never going to happen because you're going in saying, okay, I'm writing this part today. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. It's sort of just like a paint by numbers kind of situation. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, actually, g given that that's how you wrote those books and, and how you, you know, didn't necessarily have a, an outline plan in advance, I wonder what the um the rationale was then for that book to be cancelled and for you to move on to a, a you know a different telling of it. I think that was Scholastic's decision. Hmm. Really? Uh, I'm just wondering yeah, why. That was just. That was just uh, I don't think they felt that the market would support that many books in that year, so they decided to, you know, what she said was she then say it was cancelled. She said basically we're moving it. Right. Okay. And they were going to move it on the schedule, and therefore that book would not have worked where that was going to get right. put. But no, that was, they, also, that was also were... plastic. That wasn't me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, they moved it all right. They moved it right into the trash. Because <laughs> it is, it is a, a bit of a hit when that kind of thing happens, because where your schedule is pretty well staying the same, regardless of where they put it, what you're writing about now is going to be completely different when they actually want you to do it again. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. The show must go on, as they say. <laughs> hmm. yeah. And uh, and indeed, the show did go on because, of course, two thousand seven is when um, is when BionicleStory dot com opened up, um, and you started writing story serials for that. Um, was that a site that you 
uh, you pitched to them and, and you no, wanted to open? No, no, they came up with that and they just told me about it. Okay. Um, Wait, but then so the story... they, they gave you a site and just said, write for this, we're not going to pay you for it, but write for this. Well, I never got paid. The only thing I got paid extra for was the novels, and those I got paid for by Scholastic because they were freelance. I never got paid extra hmm. for the comic or anything else I did for Bionicle. It was just an extra part of my job. Okay. Wow. Um, so yeah, then the the serials on BionicleStory.com, was, was that something that you were told to do, or was that something you just did of your own volition? Well, I mean, I probably could have said no if I'd wanted to say no, but I didn't say no to stuff about Bionicle. Fair enough. <laughs> was the uh, was like the number of serials or the format they were released in or anything Lego's plan or mandate, or was, was that sort of up to you? That was really me and the web producer discussing mm. that. Okay, cool. Because, um, yeah, I, I do like how um, each of those story serials had a slightly different format to it. Uh, of course, you um, for a while you were writing three at a time, and there was one that was written in the first person as like a, a blog-style format. Uh, there was one that was more in line with the novels. And then there was one that um, you recorded yourself voicing as a podcast. Yeah. Well, that's because I didn't want to get bored, basically. <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of stuff I do, I mean, there were, there were, bio there was at least one Bionicle novel that I wrote backwards. <laughs> uh, I, I wrote the end and then I just wrote every scene backwards to the front of the book just to keep from getting bored. You happen to remember which one it was? No, I don't. But I was just like, you know, I wanted to see if I could do it. Because I well, did, traditionally, yeah. in a lot of cases, if I was doing a Bionicle book where I knew there had to be a big battle at the end or something like that. If it was like, even if it was something story Bible based, I would do the end first because I had, a, I had a very life. rich word count. And if I got to the end and I had 18,000 words done and I only had 2000 words left to do the climax, the climax wasn't going to be any good. So I had to hmm. write the climax first to make sure I had enough words to do it correctly. And then I would go back and write the other rest of the book. Okay. Right. That's pretty cool. Well, since we can't tell which one it is, I think that you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, that stands as a testament to your writing abilities, that you can write a whole book backwards and nobody would be any the wiser. Yeah, well, <laughs> it was a fun exercise. And all of this on a deadline for no extra pay. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Sure. Um. So, yeah, then the... Uh... Yeah, the story of 2007 then, um, the uh, the Tomari trying to uh, essentially re recover the Mask of Life and also get Voyanui back into its place um, in time to, to save the universe. It's, um, it's all very interesting how that entire story section takes place over the course of, I think, about 24 hours in story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually liked 2007 better than 2006, I think because... Um, while 06 was dark, I almost felt in some ways it was too dark. And also, the the so many of the Baraka came across as such brutes, mm -hmm. where the Baraki were a lot smarter in some respects, and I also felt they had a much more interesting backstory. Right. I, yeah, I think okay. that's I mean, why I like... I think that's why I like Legacy of Evil the most, because, out of the 2006 books, because Zaktan from that book becomes the only Paraka that isn't just a brutish one-note character. He has yeah. a path, and it's explained in great detail why he is the way he is. Yeah, I suppose a, a very common um, <laughs> criticism of the Paraka is that they are all quite similar. You know, they're all very, um, very violent, brutish characters. And so, yeah, then Sorry, when the Baraki came myself. along and... Okay. And so, yeah, when the Baraki came along and suddenly they're, you know, like you said, a lot smarter, a lot more cunning. Um, of course, you still got characters like Karapa who are a bit more, you know, on the uh, less intelligent side, or Tapadox, yeah, who's hyper-intelligent. I just love the idea of these guys were generals, they were, like, powerful, they were, you know, high on the food chain, and now they look like sea creatures and they're stuck in the ocean. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I find that's a really interesting dynamic that, um, that you know, you gave them. That, um, uh, that actually brings up another point that uh, I think we discussed in the 2007 episode, 
When it was established that the pit mutagen was a combination, it was a chemical reaction between the the waters of Aqua Magna and something else from the Great Spirit Robot. I don't think it was ever quite established what that something else was. Is it protodermis or just nebulous energy? I think it was. I don't think it was protodermis because we know that Gali used to swim around in Aqua Magna and had no problem. Energy. So, I think it was probably one of the chemicals that was within the robot. Hmm. It was probably the equivalent of toxic waste from the robot. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's quite fitting. Don't forget that robot was not designed to sit in an ocean for a thousand years. Right. That's true. It was designed to come down for a week or two and then leave. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, Um, So, yeah. Actually, it's like when you it's like when you go to it's like when you go to s- take a bath and you fall asleep for a thousand get all ring. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose so. Um, yeah. So then, uh, you spend a thousand years in the bathtub. I think you have a lot more to worry about than just a few wrinkles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta get that pay immortality your... sorted out first. You gotta you gotta pay your rent. Paying your rent. <laughs> Um, if I could, uh, oh, sorry, Chip, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, you, you go ahead. Uh, if I could jump back to the, the characterization of the Baraki, uh, real quick. I believe you've mentioned in the past that Takadox was sort of inspired by East from Blood Shadows. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Were there any other characters that were particularly based or inspired on a character from your previous, like, pre-Bionicle novels? Um... Not that I recall off the top of my head. Okay. Um, there probably would have been ones that down the road that I might have done that with, but I didn't have the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's I, I, it's entirely possible that I might have resurrected Black from from Hell's Feast at some point too, but I just never had a character that he worked for. Hmm. Okay. Um. So yeah. Then uh, speaking of sort of uh, big. You know, characters then, I suppose uh, we should probably talk about Matoro and um, his big moment in 2007, mm-hmm. of course. Uh, you know, his noble sacrifice to, to save the universe. Um, you know, I, I suppose, what what do you think about um, about that sacrifice, with, you know, um, and what that means for both him as a character and the characters around him, you know, his teammates? Well, I, I, I felt that we were doing a story where we had to convey that we were dealing with very high stakes. Um, and if we didn't kill someone, it wasn't going to have, I mean, you know, we never done that before with an actual Toa besides like we can, who nobody knew, you know, Mm. we never killed a major part of the team before. Mm -hmm. And, um, I really felt like we needed to do that, um, to convey that this was important and this was life or death. And I pushed for it to be Matoro because I felt that this is the guy who all along never felt he was worthy to be a Toa. Mm. You know, he never felt like he never had an ambition to be one. He never felt like he was doing enough. Uh, He never felt like he was a hero. And here's the one, he's the one who does the most heroic act at the end. Mm. I feel like moving forward too, this was the, the ultimate, goal of Legos slowly dialing back on their policies against things like death, because you have Mask of Light, where Jala dies, and then he's resurrected like five minutes later. Then you have Legends of Metronui, where Lee Khan dies, and that's permanent, but at the same time, it's not really a main character, so nobody eventually, nobody cares all that much. And then now you have Matoro, where it's a major main character, he's dead, and he's staying dead. Yeah. And I had people ask me about bringing him back after that. And I said, no, because I think it would cheapen his sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You know, if he's able to, if I just bring him back, then his, his death means nothing. And I felt that his death was a very powerful scene and I didn't want to just throw it in the trash. Mm -hmm. Though I did know, I did notice you mentioned at one point that Lee Khan is up on the red star. And I'm curious what made you come to that decision. Well, um, Recon died 
Yes. Guiguicon died within the universe, so it would make sense that he would be up there. Mm -hmm. um, but because of the way the Matoro died, you have to have a body for the Red Star to bring you back. Mm -hmm. And there was no body left of Matoro. Right. He was consumed by the energy. There was nothing for the Red Star to work on. Which really stands as a testament to just how strongly Kitongu pummeled Sidorak into the dirt. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's another point, though. You mentioned that because Likon died inside the universe. So if somebody died on the island of Matanui, would they not be brought back by default? They would not be brought back, no. The Red Star works on people within the universe, not outside of the universe. Okay. Oh, dear. Interesting. So, so I suppose that well, dispels that um, my Jala theory out yeah, the window. Say, yeah. <laughs> so, is that was the idea of the Red Star? Because for me, it was I've not done much reading outside of the main uh, storyline, so it seems very strange to me, especially with how the story ended so abruptly. Was the idea to have it sort of like a recycle bin, so that if Matanui, if the robot needed a particular element brought back in certain cases? It, it would just be saved there and then transported back when it was required. Well, the thing is, the Red Star was around from the very beginning. It was a part of the original story Bibles, but what its actual purpose was, was never articulated. Mm -hmm. okay. And so I was the one who came up with the idea of it being basically the place where they brought the dead back. And yeah, it basically was an idea of it's very wasteful if you have a component that is specialized, that has specialized skills and knowledge to just let it be gone forever because it's something malfunctioned. So it would make sense that you would have a system that would self-repair and send it back. Okay. Yeah, I suppose uh, we'll get more into that when we get to that point, because there are yeah. a lot of questions I have about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's unfortunate that never got the chance to be used properly. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, again, like like uh, like Liam said, we'll get to that. But um, I suppose in the meantime, we should go to um, 2008 then. So the uh, the battle in the sky, the Fantoka, the Mystica, uh, Toa fighting against Makuta, um, a, a whole team of Makuta this time. And um, I, I suppose the the introduction of Makuta as a species rather than as a single guy, um, that was that was very abrupt. I thought in the story it was. Um, yeah, well, how did that come to be that, you know, it just sort of, you click your fingers and it happened? Uh, well, I think that the way we felt about it was that there was never anything that said that we couldn't do that. Hmm. Um, and the more we talked about it, the more fun it sounded. Right. Um, yeah. You know, when you start establishing what the role of a Makuta actually is, is to create the creatures and to sort of be, um, in a sense, it's sort of a Manichaean sense, the god of the material world. Mm. It doesn't make sense if you only have one creature to do that. Right. It's too big of a job. So that's when we started getting the idea of there being more than one Makuta. And, um, and that was a lot of fun because we got to create some fun characters. We got to set up the idea that at the end of the day, Pterodax would betray all of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we there was a lot of rich story material to mine with that. Yeah. Okay. That does bring up another point, though. If, as you said earlier, it was never planned at this point that the robot would wake up at the end of this three-year arc. Mm -hmm. So what was the plan for ending 2008? Because well, the with the was, way they... when we when we sat down to start planning 2008, Mm -hmm. uh, I flew over to Billund for a story meeting, and by the time I got there, they had already decided they wanted to wake Matanui up. Okay. Okay, so and there never was an original plan for if no, he did No, because we did our story Bibles one year at a time. Hmm. Okay. So, um, you know, I was not initially supportive of that idea, mm -hmm. and I got outvoted. Mm -hmm. And so then I said, well... What if we wake him up, but we put Makuta into him? <laughs> and that was where that whole idea came from. And that's where the whole 2008 betrayal came from. 
and the whole notion mm-hmm. of the Toa finally think they've won and actually they've been doing what Makuta wanted them to do all along. Right. How yeah. much by how much did you get outvoted on continuing it? Oh, out I of mean, curiosity. Advance was Advance was very committed to waking him up, and the marketing read wanted to wake him up, and um, yeah. uh, and you know it, the decision had basically been made before I got there, so. So it was pretty um, unanimous that pretty much everyone just wanted to cut it right there. Well, That's it was interesting thing. because the the argument that was made was we needed to make a big change. We needed to jazz up the storyline. You know, we needed to go in this whole new direction. But when I would say, but, you know, there's a lot more story we could tell. And and I said, you know, there are going to be people that are following the storyline that don't like this idea. What I was told was, well, nobody's following the storyline. Right. And it's wow. like, but if nobody's following the storyline, they're not going to notice that you changed it. And, and I think at the, I think at this point, it's a really good um, point to bring up how eventually you were completely vindicated on that idea because when G two came out and it was so heavily watered down, and people would people at Lego saying nobody pays attention to the storyline. Well. G2's story was so bad that it didn't even make its three-year projected cycle. So I, I think you, you're spot on with that. Well, I mean, <laughs> I just... People do I, I definitely pay attention. I didn't understand the contradiction. If you're going to say nobody's following it, therefore nobody's going to get upset. But if we make this change, if, if you're going to say if we make this change, it's going to make such a difference, how is anybody going to change? Mm-hmm. Right, right, yeah. It's not something you're going to advertise. I mean, it's storyline. So I didn't really understand that. Um, But, you know, I went with it because the decision had been made and I tried to make uh, the best of it uh, and work it into what I had already been doing. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) because dating back to had had to. I assume when you were on your way over to Billen to talk about this, you did have ideas for moving forward. If this hadn't happened how would you what direction would you have gone with it oh i don't know a lot of times i didn't go in with preconceived notions Hmm. um uh you know because we would throw ideas out and build on each other's ideas sometimes you went in with ideas in your head and sometimes you didn't um so yeah okay so the um yeah the rest of 2008 then the um the toa do uh hold off the makuta they eventually managed to use the um the the power of the the now sentient uh, Toa Ignica to uh, to you know awaken Matanui and all that. Um, so Our Toa Ignica, lover of green. <laughs> yes, the, uh, the yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if um, well, no, you probably wouldn't remember, but there's a, a specific line in the book where um, where it says uh, Ignica liked the green one, referring to um, to Toa Lewa, and we no, we he, picked up on it that specifically too. says <laughs> well, he was green. Like, I, Ignica he liked like... green. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we we sort of took that and ran with it a bit, but um, Liwa yeah. tapped on his shoulder, and Ignika thought, "Is this an attack?" No, it was the green one. He liked green. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why Liwa why lives that so quickly. <laughs> or did you have that just written down? I had it. I have it memorized. <laughs> <laughs> it's engraved into my brain cells. <laughs> he liked green. And of course, this is the, around the part of the story where we find out the big reveal about the ball rock. Of course, yeah, yeah. How did you come up with that? Or was that a higher up decision? Yeah, I think that was planned from the start. Who came up with that? What? That they were cleaning <laughs> the face off? The that they were babe that they were baby. Oh, oh no, that wasn't a higher up. I came up with that. How did really? you come up with that? <laughs> because it was creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. <laughs> I like the way you yeah, think. Especially with the setting you put them in, because it's just this random, isolated tribe of Avmatoran that are just like one of those island native tribes off in the middle of the Pacific. And they're just, they solely exist there to die and turn into Bulrock. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> just, just suddenly, just suddenly, 
in just a paragraph of words, new memes were born. And the, <laughs> the box or the box or mech suits from 2002 suddenly oh, became man. dead. Yeah, the, dead the baby mech. that that yeah. makes for the boxers—they're literally made of dead matoran. Yeah, I love that. I love it. I love it. So I was, um, I was wondering, actually, are all the Avmatoran in Cardinui privy to that knowledge that they will eventually turn into Borok, or is there only a specific subset of them that knew about that? Uh, no, I think they're all pretty much aware of it. Okay. So <laughs> does that mean that eventually Takanuva will turn into a Borok, or does the Toa of Light transformation overwrite that? It overwrites it. If you're not Avmatoran, okay. it's not going to happen. Okay. All right. That would be interesting, though, if to, like if one of the Bareg died, it just took a random Toa of Light and turned it into a new one. <laughs> <laughs> that could be interesting. I so assume I, it'd be like a B thing. Uh, I think I might be. I think I might no. Be... You mean ants, uh, where they Ant. can, if they feed the larvae specific things during pupation, they can turn into different things. Well, Levi that's knows much how the cow came to be. Levi knows bug. That, that's pretty much how the cow came to be, if I recall correctly. Um, it, the Barag immersed Krana in some substance. Um, that, that's a good point, too. It Was that energized protodermis? Because it was very vague what I it was. I think at the, the time, Barag the idea used. was it was E plus something else. Okay. Interesting. Mm. Okay. Uh, like so those I, uh... toxic chemicals that did the pit mutant. <laughs> I, I suppose that extrapolating from the um, you know Avmatoran turning into Borok thing, uh, n now that you know all of the Avmatoran and other Matoran have emigrated to Spherus Magna and the Masnui robot has shut down, will those Avmatoran still transform eventually? Or is that something they have to worry about? Uh, I don't think it will still work because they're not in the universe anymore. Mm. Okay. Hmm. So destiny is only calculated when you're in the universe then. Yeah, well, Otherwise, basically, des just... destiny is what role you're supposed to play in the grand right. scheme of keeping this machine running. Right. And it's ultimately okay. up to Mata Nui's will what happens to you. But if Mata Nui whatever, doesn't do anything, whatever pre programming was done before Mata Nui launched. Right. right. So if there's no will being exerted on the beings, then it's sort of like you do whatever you want. Well, that's the beauty of. of, of the Spherus Magna story, and the reason I kept, wish we could have kept doing it is all of a sudden you've got all these beings who don't have destinies anymore. Mm. Yeah, you sort of touched on that a bit at the beginning of the story when you mentioned Kopaka, like, sort of pondering, well, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, I suppose, you know, jumping ahead a little bit, but, um, you know, speaking of those, uh, those later um, uh, Spherus Magna stories, uh, I believe someone mentioned somewhere that um, in addition to you just, you know, not having the, the time to write them, uh, you know, with all the things that were going on in your life at the time, uh, at some point Lego uh, essentially stopped you from writing more? Is that true? Well, no. The, the, the question is, I had somebody ask me about finishing them. Mm, and That was the probably point, James, I believe. And the point that I made was the fact that because I work for Lego, I can't write fan fiction. Anything mm. I write is mm -hmm. going to be considered official. Which right, means right. That somebody at Lego would have to read it and approve it. And, and they don't want to continue this right now. And since it's not an active line, who are you going to ask to do that? Right. Okay. Right. You no, know, you're not going to pay somebody to approve stuff for a line that you're not selling anymore. And so there's no way you can ask now. them for permission to. I did. I actually you. asked to finish them before G2 got released. I said, mm. well, given that we're going to release a new incarnation. Do you want me to finish these stories, tie up these loose ends so that G1 is completely done? And then you go into G2, and yeah, I got a resounding silence. Wow. Well, so. That's a real shame, too. And now it's even more difficult because G2 flopped horribly, and it had a completely different team behind it. So it's even diff more difficult now to find out who to ask than it would have <laughs> been before then. Well, the fact is that, you know, Lego's not going, I don't think, I don't, I mean, if I were Lego, I wouldn't, because wouldn't you rather have your people focusing their energy and their resources promoting stuff that you're actually selling? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It yeah, doesn't, that doesn't make sense. I mean, it doesn't, it's the same. I mean, I personally think Bionicle could have been like Star Trek where you had 
years and years and years of novels coming out when there were no movies and there were no TV show and there was no nothing. Mm -hmm. But that's how I would have liked the it. The attitude you. of the publishers is if there are no toys being sold, we don't have all that free advertising, so we don't want to do it. Yeah, I, I mean, mean really at the end of the day, like I was a toy company. That that is that really is Bionicle's downfall in the long term. I always felt that if Bionicle were to come back in any way, it would be best to come back completely <coughs> isolated from the sets because they are its Achilles heel. If there are no sets, Lego is not going to do anything with it. And it also holds back what you can do with the story because you have to go through marketing. You have to go through set design. You have all these prerequisites of what you can, can and can't write based on what everyone else is doing. Yeah, but the thing is that uh, what what we were always told and what we knew from the beginning is story only exists to promote sets. Mm -hmm. And it isn't, you know, we're not an IP company, we're a toy company. And, and that, there, were times when we would be in, there were times we would be in story team meetings. This was back when Bob was on the team and we would be talking about, oh, let's do this and let's do that. We kind of go down this rabbit hole and the marketing, we would go, but we have to sell plastic. Right. right. What it's you're like doing every, is every decision. plastic, then that doesn't benefit us. Anymore. Yeah. It, ultimately, it would come down to every decision <laughs> comes down to, well, how does this benefit us hmm. rather than what makes a good story? And that's yeah. a real shame, I think. Well, I mean, the thing is, if, if, if Star Trek had been come up with by Hasbro rather than by Paramount, you know, it would be the same situation. There would have been no nothing once the toys weren't being produced anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping Bionicle can at least be like Transformers and eventually Lego will uh, have worked out how to bring back Bionicle and like have a new <laughs> cycle going every year. And yeah, just like how Transformers has like 20 different generations that are completely unrelated. When when Transformers first started, it it took a couple e it took a couple years for them to release a new iteration, mm -hmm. uh, and it's only it's only in the modern era that that they basically have the new iteration ready to go by the time the the last one is is over. Uh, so at this at this time, uh, Bionicle is is really matching the trajectory of Bi of Transformers. At least as far as I know. At least as far as I, I can I just tell. hope that if they do make a G3, they do treat it with a little more respect. Because, like, I know we're kind of getting off on a tangent here, but even from the beginning, it was obvious that, at least to me, that LEGO really didn't care about what they were doing. Right down to the whole, the web design. Like, they couldn't even spell Onua's name right. For, like, a month, the website had him listed as Anya. <laughs> it... I I don't think it was as much as Lego didn't care as much as they were just kind of frantically running around uh, juggling various IPs, just throwing anything at the wall to see what would stick. And mm -hmm. they they wouldn't know that Bionicle was what stuck until a couple of years later. By then it was mm -hmm. like too late. It was like already too late. Like, oh, oh, this is the thing that's going to save our company. And we couldn't <laughs> even spell the main character, one of the main characters' names right. Oops. Well, it's too late. Let's make a movie. And then yeah. they made a movie. I suppose. Um, so, yeah, I guess, yeah, uh, yeah wrapping up with uh, with 2008 then, the um, <laughs> because I guess that's where we were. The, um, yeah, yeah the, the Awakening of the Great Spirit, of course, that all happened. And then uh, Matanui's soul being... Um, you know, bounced to the mask of life and ejected into space. Um, you know, really setting the setting the story off on a on a very different uh, trajectory. Then, because I mean, like you said, the story team wanted to uh, to you know branch off and do something new, something fresh, and that certainly happens because you know suddenly we're in the desert and there's a whole new cast of characters with all new names and uh, a whole new world to explore. Uh, how is it to you know suddenly be thrown into into this new world? Well, it was a lot of fun, actually. I mean, it was nice. I, I, I miss the MU. You know, I love the MU. There are still MU stories that I could have told. But it was fun having this whole new world to explore. 
and this whole new culture and and the beauty of if we had kept going would have been the merging of the Agorian Glatorian culture with the Toa and the Matoran. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and what the conflicts would have been there, you know. Uh there would have been a lot of a lot of I mean there would have been mixed Glatorian Toa teams out adventuring and it would have been a lot of fun. Mm, yeah, there, there was a, a little uh, hint of that in um in the powers that be, I think. Um with uh, uh, Orde and Gelu and uh, Chiara and Zarya. And yeah, it was a team. lot of fun to, to play around with. And, you know, of course, I got the opportunity to to do the screen treatment for the movie, and that was extremely exciting. Mm. Uh, you know, that was that was really cool. And then I, I worked very closely with the screenwriter um, as she worked on the script um, to basically make sure that, you know, they were being true to Bionicle. Mm. That, that that's a lot of uh that's something else that I wanted to mention as well. Um during the core war, I forget which comic it was, I think it's all our sins remembered. It was shown off that the Glatorian back then also had elemental powers. Was that a part of their weapons or was that just was, a skill that they lost? It was part of their weaponry. Okay. okay. Hmm. Hmm. So I, I guess perhaps that was um you know, with obviously we can, you know, leave it mostly up to fan interpretation, but um you know, but perhaps that was something to do with the uh, the element lords imbued their weapons with elemental power, something like that. Yeah, and, and of course the idea was that was what inspired the Toa to have elemental powers. Of course, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um so yeah, so we've got Masanui, you know, on this new world. Uh suddenly he's not a 40 million foot tall robot. He's, uh, you know, just a, an, an itty bitty seven feet tall. And um... I hate being short. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I love that yeah. line. I love that line so much. Yeah. And, uh, and he arrives and, um, and, you know, he gets embroiled very quickly in, you know, in Baramagna's problems and, and, you know, in many cases being the solution to those problems. Um, for example, the, you know, the whole Skrull thing, they'd been, terrorizing the Igori for years and years at that point, and um, and then, you know, I don't know, he comes along and he's just like, oh, I'm just gonna beat the leader up. <laughs> I really do like how um, how the book, the novelization, went over the fight with Tuma in comparison to the movie itself, mm. and I'm curious like, uh, which one, since you also did, went over the script for the movie, which one would you? Which version of the fight would you more consider canon? Oh well, I mean, if you're going to ask me, it's always going to be what I wrote, <laughs> right? You know. Well, I was just I'm curious not... since you said you also helped with the movie script, and yeah, they're two very different fights. I did, but but you know, at the end of the day, there's other people besides the writers that are making about how the movie's going to get put together, right? So, um. But that, I mean, that whole experience was uh, was fun. And it was fun, and it was. Uh, well, I almost got to do the script for the movie, which would have also been really cool. Um, wow! But um, you know, they did they did tell me after all everything was all said and done. Treatments for the next two, so. Um, you know, mm. I would have gotten to still be in, really involved with it, but I mean, I, I spent a lot of uh, a lot of evenings and a lot of weekend afternoons on the phone with the uh, with one of the producers and the screenwriter, just going over stuff and making notes and and uh, mm. you know telling them and maybe this should be like this, and you know, we worked very well together. Mm-hmm. That's good to hear. Um, so yeah, I suppose then. Um... Uh, there, there was one, um, there, there was one character from the 2009 sets that never really appears in the story, and that was the um, the rider of the of the the car um, set, uh, Perditus. The the Thornadus. Um, yeah, the, yeah. Um, did you ever have any plans to introduce him into the story? What was the question? I'm sorry. Uh, so the the Glatorian Perditus, the uh, the driver of the Thornatus, the the car set from 2009. Uh, he never actually appeared in the story. I was wondering, did you have any plans ever to introduce him into the story? Um, I don't recall. I think because he wasn't going to be in the movie, and um, 
Uh, I think we just had so many gosh darn characters we were dealing with that year that I just didn't find room for them. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. That's right. It's a tough asset management. Mm. Um, yeah, so then... Um, he he Arthur... really did get the rough end of the stick, too, because he he never appeared in any media, and his car got more characterization than he did. <laughs> <laughs> Our good friend suddenly the, the oranges. Chariot. Our good friend suddenly oranges uh, made a uh, stop motion type of uh, film, uh, and he he came up with something good for Perditas, But it it really really the only thing that anyone ever came up with that for good for him. It's it only works in a Toy Story setting. Uh, <laughs> he, it's like you, you basically. The only plot anyone could tell with him was the story of a toy that got that got forgot. You just tell a side story where he just he's just there in the desert and Kina robs him GTA style. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> no, I like the idea of him there on the sidelines, like, guys, I'm here, please include me. <laughs> please, pay atten- please remember me. I have a car. God damn it. He's like the, he's like that one friend that no one really liked, but he's the only one with a driver's license. So- <laughs> <laughs> I, I do actually like how um in the in the novelization of the um the Legend Reborn movie, uh there's a particular line in there that's um that's not in the movie itself but is in the, the book version. In that um Kina at some point, you know, um when they're about to take her car to um uh, to the the water village, uh, Tejun. Um, it it says the reason that they didn't take sandstalkers is because Kina's was sick. So I I just love the implication that <laughs> the horses are more reliable than the cars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's actually another point uh, I wanted to mention. But make a counter for how many times I say that. Jesus. Um, I remember hearing somewhere that there was a mandate by someone that the Matoran universe can and should not have wheels. Yeah. And that that would have been a big change for Bar Magna because that restriction was no longer there. Yeah. Yep. Uh, was there uh, a course, reason for the no wheels thing, or was it just that a was, uh, That was something that I heard from Bob. I think that was decided before I ever was working on it. Okay. Hmm. I think they just felt like that was one way to make it different. It's it's right. such, it's such a bizarre concept, but it it served its intended function. Yeah, yeah it, of course, it's um, one of those things where it's a small idea, but it has wide-reaching implications. Like when it comes time to make a transfer, transportation vehicle, how does it locomote if it does not have wheels? It it uses magic frisbee and crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or sometimes the vehicle itself just has legs. Or it could be a caterpillar bus. Yeah. yeah <laughs> well, that's pretty much what a lot of the Metronui vehicles were. Yeah. Bionicle yeah. is Bionicle is the only the only medium is the only media franchise in the universe where roller skate add to a character's mystique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with Umbra. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's like one of only two instances where the set designers broke away from that idea, and just because of how few things actually do it, it sets it apart in a really weird antithetical way. Uh, I do like how the uh, the other instance of wheels in the Matoran universe is the the Destral cycle. It's just, um, uh, <laughs> it's just a motorcycle. Mo- freaking bionicles on motorcycles. <laughs> Of course, um, something else that that didn't exist in the Matoran universe, um, except in a very few uh, situations, was paper. Um, I know that you know a lot of the time it's shown that you know bionicle characters they they write on stone, they they chip away and they carve it in, they carve their messages into stone. Even on Metronui, which was otherwise very technologically advanced. Why would and, anyone uh, use this when there's perfectly good rocks to write on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to bring up that scene with the, the in the Great Temple. <laughs> Yeah, when they find that scroll. <laughs> I just love that whenever they encountered something that wasn't part of their universe, 
that was just commonplace to us. They just be they just be like, oh, well, this is this is weird. I like our thing. I like writing on rocks. To me. Uh, there is a lot. Uh, we've gone over this a lot in our recording, but retroactive foreshadowing is something you really enjoy writing, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> At a certain point, at a certain point while we were reading, because we, uh, I don't, I, I, I obviously writing the books, uh, uh, yearly, you probably, it, it probably wasn't the intent for anyone to read these books, uh, as quickly as we did over the last year, but it, it practically became a running gag, the retroactive foreshadowing. <laughs> It was like, this thing, this thing couldn't possibly happen, happens immediately after. <laughs> we very, yeah, we like, very, we very much enjoy it, enjoy it. <laughs> just yeah. all of these writing quirks. It, it was quite yeah. amusing when we were reading the, um, the 2004, 2005 story where, uh, you know, Nuju, for example, was uh, saying, uh, speaking with the birds, I'd never do something like that. That's ridiculous. And then. Of course, Rahi becomes a Taraga. Kama once went over. One day it'll be as simple as a Rahi. I'll take off its mask and the battle will be won. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, lo lo lots of instances during the flashbacks. Um, I love this. <laughs> yeah. uh, so then I suppose, um, you know, seeing as we're you know, more or less uh, done with 2009, we should talk about 2010 and the um, the you know, official end, I guess, to Bionicle and the uh, the last few story serials that trailed off from it. Well, my Man, daughter Jack. wanted me to bring up the fact that uh, the latter at the latter end of the year, when I was doing the serials, that um, they were mostly done with her sleeping on my lap. <laughs> so it was just a baby at that point, and and so <laughs> she'd have her head on one leg and her feet on the other leg, and she'd be sound asleep while I was typing away. And oh, that's adorable. Would pack, and mom, you would bring me to you, yeah. and then I would sleep on you, that's and then right. you would cry. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And of course, did you, well, did, you, did you know that mommy used to do the voice of one of the characters on the podcast? For real? Yeah. All the female <laughs> characters mommy did the voice for. Yeah. Uh, Toa Tuya, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'm curious then, um, of course, you know, you got your daughter there. Uh, has she read much, much of Bionicle? Did she read it? Yeah, I mean, has she, you know, since? Who, my daughter or my wife? My ex-wife. Uh, your daughter? Uh, no, she's never read anything, any Bionicle. Okay. Really hey, bad. You, you gonna introduce it to her someday? Well, we'll see. I don't know if it's the kind of thing she'd be into. <laughs> Only time will tell. And I so then, she, yeah. I hope she enjoys it if she ever does pick it up. Mm, definitely. <clears throat> uh, so then, yes, moving on to 2010 then. So the um, the, the big climactic battle, of course, um, you know, Makuta brings the entire Matoran universe crashing down onto Barra Magna. Uh, Matanui has found another robot body that he's using as well. And between the two of them, somehow, uh, they, they pull through, or at least Matanui does. He uh, he pulls the different parts of the moons together, uh, reforms the planet, and ends up killing Makuta in the process. Um, I love your choice of words there, that he pulls through. That's very uh, apt. Yes, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Not intentional. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so, so something I was curious about is that um, you know, at some point during that fight, uh, Masanui says you know, that there were always meant to be two. Um, there, there needed to be two robots to... Uh, to complete the mission, I was wondering what what were the um, how did the great beings plan on accomplishing that? Because when they launched the you know the Matanui robot that we all know and love, it, that was pretty much as the planet was breaking apart. Um, did they have plans for a second robot and just never got around to making it? Yeah. Okay. Um. So potentially, well, then, well, as, far, they as, far out as, as far as we know, they never made it. Right. Right. But that doesn't mean they never made it. Oh, that yeah. is a sneaky that implication. Just means we don't know whether they made it or not. <laughs> okay, right. Liam, put that put that in your notes. Put that in your notes, Liam. There's a third <laughs> robot somewhere. 
<laughs> well, you know, know. We, we only ever saw a small section of Barra Magna. There's a whole planet. <laughs> there's, just another, there's just another giant robot hiding on the other side of the planet. <laughs> I remember hearing at one point... I don't point know how you'd hide you that. Wanted, I remember hearing at one point, too, you wanted to write a story about a great being civil war. Yes. How, how do you... Th how, how was that plan to initiate was that to sub, supposed to tie in with Balika's arc yeah because okay. Balika's whole attitude was the reason that the planet was in such bad shape is that the um, the great beings were not active enough mm -hmm. okay. they that they were they were taking too passive of a role uh and that obviously these people can't rule themselves somebody needs to rule them mm -hmm. Okay, and of course the writing about the red star. Yeah, I remember somebody mentioning that it was supposed to ultimately be like a zombies in space story that you wanted yeah. to write. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. and and what was going to end up happening with that was that, like most things in the Matoran universe, it really didn't work that well, <laughs> and it was basically going to turn out that the recreations that it was making, uh, basically deteriorated over time. Right. Oh, okay. so you're pulling, you're sort of coming back to that that thing in 2004 where Makuta was trying to make things with a finite life cycle, but they all came out super weird. Yeah, basically, you know, you were going to wind up with a lot of um, a lot of um, beings who were rotting essentially, yeah. and uh, and didn't want to die, but didn't have much choice about it and probably going to get pretty angry about it. Okay. So where does that leave where does that leave characters like Mavra and to uh, Taragalikon then who for all intents and purposes at least up to the point you wrote seem to be perfectly fine. Well, yeah, they were perfectly fine, but they're not <laughs> going to stay perfectly fine. Maybe because they can make better life decisions. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Because the big the big knock on the Red Star storyline was people saying, well, yeah, but now it doesn't mean anything if you die, because you're just going to come back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this this was going to restore the fact that, no, it, death it still matters, because, yeah, you'll come back, but you're not going to stay. Right. Interesting. Okay. So that opened up a lot of ideas, too, of characters who could come back and realize their their time was limited and try to finish up unfinished business before they died again. If they knew that that was going to happen to them, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Throughout and the that podcast, have, could have gotten I made, a good side story out of that. Yeah. Throughout the podcast, I made a lot of connections to the great beings and the master builders in the Lego movie. They can <laughs> basically do anything... But they're not very good at it. <laughs> well, I, I always looked at the at the situation with Mata Nui is you're trying to build this incredibly complex thing in an enormous rush. And so you're going to make yeah. mistakes. That, that's um, something else, too. Um, it, it was mentioned in that we have all these alternate universes at this point. And yeah. in one of them that um, Zika goes into, Mata Nui was never built, and instead the, the Toa and Matoran were built in, you know, reverse height. And it was also mentioned later on with Anona that he fed off the great beings' minds, but they sort of fed back. So right. it, it seems to me like the only reason Mata Nui was built was because Anona sort of corrupted their minds and made put, sent them into a hyper creative state. No, well, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't recall that myself. But oh. um, well, that's uh, just the way I interpret it. Is what I mean. But um, you know, the whole the whole thing with me from the beginning was that we had these references from the very beginning of the story to the great beings and I really liked the idea that they really weren't they were mm -hmm. smart they were creative but they really weren't great uh, so I suppose then with the um, with the, the introduction of the uh, Bionicle stars and the, the final wave of Bionicle um, I suppose that, that might have 
well, that that definitely did change, you know, what had been planned up until that point, because there was going to be, you know, the whole Valley of the Maze thing and the uh, and going to the Bota Magna region and yep. um, all the robot dinosaurs and everything. So um, I was just thinking, like, in terms of how you know the the cancellation and the um, the the rush to wrap things up went, um, you know, I, I suppose how much of that planned story did you get to tell in a condensed form? Oh well, I mean, nothing of nothing of um, nothing of uh, the, the original story I come up with in 2010 made it into the novel. Um, mm. uh, we had to come up with, you know, we didn't have 2011 planned. We weren't planning on ending Bionicle in 2011, so I, we basically had to come up with how the heck are we going to end this whole story now? Right. Okay. And then okay. it was a question of is there going to be any way to get the end of this story out to people? And that's ultimately where BionicleStory.com came into play even more. Well, BionicleStory.com, in the end, uh, also was a way to keep the trademarks active. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. To, to that end, did I know you mentioned the, the things about the finite life cycle and the Red Star. Did you have anything else, you know, that you were planning on writing or that you had ideas for moving forward like the purpose of Merendar or as you mentioned oh, I mean, the is, like Takanubi there are, destiny. There, there, first of all there were a lot of things I threw into the story that I didn't have any idea what they were going to be or where they were going to go but it forced me to come up with what they were going to be and where they were going to go right. mm -hmm. um, um, to keep me interested but the fact mm -hmm. is I mean we are we are 10 years out from the end of Bionicle. I could still have been writing Bionicle every month the last 10 years and be <laughs> nowhere near being done with stories. Right. Uh, I suppose that, that, uh, that reminds me a lot of, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, um, the, the, the uh, Japanese uh, comic uh, One Piece that um, has been going on for you know, a good 20 years now. And uh, the author of that says he's only uh, you know, two thirds done or something like that. <laughs> Which is exactly what he said about ten years ago. <laughs> or how about oh, uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, for that matter? Yeah, that's true. That's true. There's uh, yeah, there's plenty of stories that you know are just designed in such a way that they could potentially go on forever. Um, so it would be interesting to see. Well, you know, and it's a it's a tribute to Bob and to the people that were on the original story team who created mm -hmm. a universe that was that wide open. Definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. And um, I suppose that feeds into you know the the community, of course. You know there have been so many fan fictions written, so many you know fan creations that was always pushed by like it was a big thing. Um, and you know what what do you think of like you know um, the the outpouring of of you know fan creations, like stop motion animations and, and uh, fan built sets and things? What, what do you think of all that? And did you have any favorites? Uh, well, to be honest with you, I never paid that much attention because of the fact that I was writing story, so I couldn't mm. look at what somebody else was doing for fear I might steal it without meaning to. Right, uh, right. But, but yeah, because I remember I also, hearing you know, that you... I always told people that you know, without the fans, Star Trek would have died after 1968 mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, um, it's only the fans that kept it alive, and it's only the fans that keep Bionicle alive, and it's like they say. If you're in somebody's heart, you're never dead. Mm. So as long as Bionicle is still in people's hearts, it's not dead. Definitely. Okay then. So um, I, you know what? I think um, yeah, we're we're getting towards uh, towards the end of everything now. Uh, I think before we wrap up, um, Josie, do you want to ask some of those questions that you had lined up? Ah, uh, yes. I also have a couple. Okay. Uh, I I call this the carousel of destiny. I'm going <laughs> I'm going to generate random numbers and ask questions that correspond to that. It's the only way to be fair to all the people that submitted questions. I I told people uh a week before the episode came out, what are some questions you've always wanted to ask Mr. Greg if you had less than 2 weeks to live? Answer ask ask now. Uh, I still can't stop this every time. Like we have to have Mr. Greg from Steven Universe playing at some point in this. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. So first we got a question from Bonkleton. 
He uh, Bonkleton asked uh, a ton of Bonkle questions, so statistically, okay. they were going to have a uh, probably going to have a question at some point. Uh, let's see. Does the pit mutagen have the same effects on members of the same species? The paraca, the paraca all turning into spine snakes, for example. Not necessarily. Hmm. The pit mutagen has the effect on a species that I needed to have it have the effect of. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so it's a very useful plot device. Okay. okay. Let's see. Uh, just gonna just gonna erase all of their questions now, so I don't. Okay. I, I have a. In the meantime, I have a, I, I'm gonna have yeah, a thing like, that uh, one question per customer. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, then Levi, uh, you said you had a couple of questions. You want to ask one? Uh, well, so I was earlier in the podcast. I was listening to you, and it seems like Bionicle was less your baby and more an adopted child you grew attached to. Um, <laughs> so, was there something about Bionicle in particular that piqued your interest to put so much crea creativity into this story? Um. Well, I mean, I just I remember reading the story Bible and just falling in love with it, um, and just really enjoying the 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 the, the depth they gave to it. Because I mean, it was so early in my Lego career; it was like one of the first things I did at Lego was read this Bible. Um, and um, and then you know, I didn't think I was going to get to work on it. I mean, I really wanted to do the comic, but I had no reason to think I was going to get to. And um, you know, for for. 10 years basically it was it was the best part of my job and um so that um, sort of oh, continue sorry i mean it was it was seven days a week between between writing it and being on bz power and all of that it was seven days a week that i was immersed in that so that sort of well, connects to my other question um was there a particular aspect of the story, be it adventure or deep character writing? Was, was there something that you sat down and you were like, yes, today I'm going to do this. This is, this is going to be good. Um, I don't do a lot of, if I, if I sit down and say today I'm going to do this, then what comes out is completely different. <laughs> um, I'm, loved, uh, I'm like that all the time. It's <laughs> Um, so a lot of times I, I, I didn't have that. And there were days that I would spend the whole day just walking around the house trying to figure out how I was going to get them out of what I got them in. Um, right. but you know, it was, it was, it was a combination of, I think the thing I loved about Bionicle was the depth. You could write stories that were in depth. You could write you know, 20,000 words and, and explore these characters and you could grow the characters and you didn't have to reset at the end and make them go back to being right where they were at the beginning of the story. If they grew and changed, they grew and changed and they stayed that way. To that end, yeah. I'm curious if you were ever even asked to, to do anything for G2. I know you were consulted, but were you ever asked to write for it? No. That's a real shame, honestly. No, after I was, all you I did was, for that, I was I was told that they want. So he wrote them back and said, "Well, it's your job to make those decisions, and it's my job to go along with what you've decided." Hmm. And I said, based on that, I don't think it makes any sense for me to be involved with it, even on the magazine level. So I'll have somebody else write the stuff for the magazine. And right. um, and then I just took a policy of I'm not going to comment on the line because I'm not in it. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Um, if you had been asked to read about G2, what is there a particular direction you would have taken it in knowing that it was a full-on reboot? It's not really something I can comment on. I mean, I I don't have freedom to take it in any different direction. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I think to some extent they made the right decision because you know, uh, for a couple reasons. One is the fact that the Bionicle that I wrote was aimed at 10 and 11 year olds. Mm -hmm. You know, the communication, no one is any skew Um, The communication was intentionally written for 10 and 11 year olds 
in hope that eight year olds would get into it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, G2 always felt like it was aimed at a younger audience. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, when I was first told I wasn't going to be working on it, my boss at the time came to me and he said, well, you know, he said, you already did that. You were already successful at that. You don't need to be successful at it again. And it doesn't need to be successful at you again, I guess. You know, um, <laughs> you know, he basically said, you don't have anything to prove. You don't have to do it again. You already did it. So, mm-hmm. you know, with that in mind, I, I wasn't so upset about it then. Okay. Uh, so, I uh, find that a little, I find that very disappointing because it implies that both you and Bionicle are a one-trick pony, and that's definitely not the case for either. There well, was a I lot more I, to be told, as you said. Well, I know, but but they didn't want to pick up from original story. They wanted to do something totally new. And I mm-hmm. think their feeling was maybe I'm too identified with the old story, and they didn't want people to think this was a resumption of the old story. I don't I don't have any idea what their thinking was. Oh, that's all I was told. Okay. That, that's really that's interesting too, though, because there are so many subtle references to the old story in an otherwise unsubtle story that if they were trying to go into a new direction, they really just couldn't separate themselves from the old one. There were either implications or like direct or like direct mentions of the Mask of Time and like a literal link to the previous iteration like there was going to be sort of crossover or something maybe a mm-hmm. dc maybe a dc convergence type thing <laughs> uh, i suppose then go, going off of that um you know greg if you say hypothetically you know there was a a g3 uh, announced and you knew the writers who were going to be working on it and you couldn't you know influence them directly but you could give them say a, a few tips on how to how to write their story what sort of tips would you give them Liam, you know, I mean, the main it. thing the main thing that I think is important and that I tried to do with Bionicle and I tried to do with the Ninjago books I did is don't write down to your audience. I mean, I did an awful lot of personal appearances and cons and stuff during the time that I was working on Bionicle and the kids I was meeting were brilliant. They knew the story better than pretty much anybody at Lego and, um, and they had incisive incredible questions to ask and um and they understood what we were doing they yeah. under they understood what we were doing and they didn't get confused by it and they understood the story a lot better than the adults did mm-hmm. um so you know i always took the attitude of you know what if they don't know this word they'll go look it up mm-hmm. yeah. that's, really that that's take, one thing opinion. that i wanted to mention as well like I know I sort of brought this up in my initial message to you when this whole start, the whole thing started, but you and your writings are pretty well solely responsible for my level of speaking the English language these days because of a lot of use of those uncommon pseudo old English words. Same. And I really hope that a lot of other children who read your material ended up that way because it, it was enough just re- like I've been homeschooled most of my life and just reading your books was enough to officially assess me at a postgraduate English level. Well, and the thing is, I got the same thing out of reading comic books when I was a kid. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, they were considered to be for children, but they were not writing vocabulary. It was not for children. Mm-hmm. Um, and and. I learned a lot of things, a lot of what I know about story structure, uh, a lot of what I know about, you know, a lot of things between that and growing up listening to old radio. It really does stand as a testament to how much of a disconnect there is between people on higher levels in these companies and the actual writers. who The higher ups seem to think that children are stupid. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's that, I, I, I've always, I basically always made the point in, in working on the magazine, too, mm-hmm. that in my experience, Lego kids are smarter than average kids. Mm. Mm. I suppose a, a big thing with, you know, whenever you're writing, you know, fiction for children, um, you know, it's a, a pattern that, uh, that I've noticed, you know, when I was growing up and uh, among my friends is that 
with kids, they always tend to be interested in the stuff that's written for, you know, kids that are one or two years older than them. You know, they always look up and they think, oh, that's cool. I'm going to learn, you know, to, to appreciate that rather than, you know, the stuff that's made for uh, people younger than them, which they see as lame. They don't want to interact with that. So um, they're reading so th stuff that isn't pandering to the lowest common denominator. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, like I said, the, the plan from the beginning was to make Bionicle aspirational. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the whole idea. We didn't expect 10 and 11 year olds to run out and buy the sets. But we figured if we tell a story for 10 and 11 year olds, it'll suck the eight year olds in. Mm -hmm. Certainly did. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I was seven when I got into it. And yeah, <laughs> it works. I couldn't even pronounce Bionicle when I first got into it. It was funny for me when I first found it. It was, I know you were writing the magazine at the time, which is a really interesting fact because um, I'm not sure if the magazine, I think the magazine did have regional differences. I'm in Canada and mm -hmm. the initial advertisement for Bionicle in our Lego Mania magazine was probably very different than the one in the actual US magazine for us. It was just a little tiny thumbnail image, no wider than maybe an inch and a half, with that initial 2001 image of Onua digging through a cave and just the title Bionicle, amongst a whole bunch of other images saying, see what's new on, on lego.com. Mm -hmm. And that alone was what got me initially hooked, because I looked at this thing that looked like this silver robot kind of thing that looked absolutely nothing like anything else that was on the page. And I was thinking to myself, what is that? I want to know what that is. Mm. And I still have that page, by the way. The, uh, we got scans of that magazine on Biomedia Project. So that was really fun to find. I just kind of attached myself to anything that Lego did. But I feel like even if I had been more discerning as a kid, Bionicle would have really grabbed me. It's interesting that you brought up uh, regional differences, Liam, because um, in the UK, the uh, the Lego magazine, um, at least at the time, I don't know if it does now, but at the time it never came with comics. So we didn't get the Bionicle comics at all, and we didn't get most of the books either. It was only well, the first few. The, uh, none of the European magazines, uh, they very rarely ever came with comics because mm. you had additional, uh, you had to pay for um, uh, the plastic bag. You had to pay for the right. extra shipping because of the extra weight. And course, Bionicle yeah. was always uh, more of a U.S.-fueled line. It, it was always more of a, a bigger seller here than it was overseas. And yeah. the, the market just wasn't going to pay for, um, mm. that, for that extra expense. That really bothered me when they stopped using the plastic bags in around 2008, I think it was. Because often I had two subscriptions to the Lego magazine at the time, one at my grandparents' place and one at home. And I would always keep one copy of both the magazine and the comic put away for storage and safekeeping or whatever, and another to just read through. And around the time they stopped using the bags, they started adhering the comics into the front cover of the magazine with rubber cement. Oh, I hate that. Which is perfectly fine when you fully intend to take the comic out. But if you're putting them away like I do, the side effect of that is, unfortunately, over a period of several years, the magazine, the, the rubber cement starts leaking grease into the paper. So now wow. all my good copies of the comics have this grease stain going down the spine. Oh, dear. Uh, oh. No well, one guys, I gotta me. get some dinner for my little girl. Yeah, okay, right. that's fair enough. Okay, I love you. Pleasure. Absolutely, it's it's been an honor having <laughs> you on. Very nice having you on. Well, anytime, yeah. guys. Yeah. Uh, I love brilliant. you, Greg. Well, You're my. F I love you, Greg. You're my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps we'll speak to you again sometime. Okay. Yeah. Take care, guys. Ah, uh, you as well. You okay. Bye bye. Goodbye. So I guess um, we won't really be getting the, many of those viewer questions today. <laughs> I suppose I got, We got yeah. one in. <clears throat> yeah. Did that really happen? Congratulations happened? to the guy who spammed a thousand times. That, well I, done. I, you really, I, you I, gamed I, the system I think, there? I think yeah. they might be a woman. I would, I, would, I would try to use gender neutral stuff, gender neutral terms. But I'm I already said he, so I already messed it up. 
<laughs> well, I mean, we never got, you know, consistent pronouns for an owner, so why should we care about Bionicle fans? <laughs> My next question yeah. would have been one of mine. <laughs> Apparently, I won the lottery. And uh, <laughs> it would have been it would have been a very embarrassing one to read out. Fantastic. I read it because I was going to read it uh, as it was written. Quote, where does <coughs> sleep go? <laughs> oh, wow. Very incisive. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, as I, like with, Bi- uh... I like Bionicle. Bionicles are good. Yeah. I mean, don't we all love Bionicle? Isn't that why we're here? <laughs> Yay! Yeah. I think the resounding answer to that is sometimes. <laughs> I, <hope that> <laughs> I think this may be the first time we did an important and we didn't mess it up. I know, also, has anyone horrible. else noticed that Greg didn't actually leave? Yeah, yeah I, I saw think, that. Uh, I'll, I'll just um, kick him from the call. <laughs> oh no. Rude! Uh, I... <laughs> So we are doing a follow-up episode with Greg's daughter as a guest, right? She was great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we've cleaned, cleared that one with the legal team. Well, well we do still need to do that stop. one final, final, final episode with his script for the movie sequel. But yes, That's this true. would probably be the official season finale to Gathered Friends. Yes. Um, one day Greg's daughter will be the social media icon of a generation. <laughs> One day. But one for day. now, she is still young. She is growing. One day, she will start a Twitter, I guess. <laughs> if <laughs> Twitter was even around in like seven years. Because that you went so no well for you, Josie. Where you going with that, do you? <laughs> what, about, what about TikTok? Is that, is that what the kids are into these days? That's what the kids and also pedophiles are into yes oh no oh, <laughs> oh no leave, leave, levi you still need to start a twitter it only i have a twitter took, i'm just not it using took, it ever oh it you took, have a twitter do you guys guys yep. it took all of five minutes for Greg leaving for us to go off the rails <laughs> <laughs> hey we we kept we all kept it in pretty good i think you know? Yeah, five minutes of no Greg first mention of pedophiles. Yeah, well done. I Good job, guys. Well done. I haven't, sl- I haven't slept longer than four hours in a day, and I did this I to myself. For Fifteen on- hours last night. I did this to myself on purpose so that I wouldn't be super hyper. Yeah, you sounded yeah, you drunk sounded this drunk entire time. <laughs> I, I did this for I did this for you. Hopefully, Greg <laughs> didn't. Hopefully, Greg just thought I was actually a robot, and I didn't ruin everything. <laughs> ruin make everything. sure you get some sleep after this recording ends. All right. I'm going to sleep all day. Good, good. And then I'm a cat. And but I think we should up. probably wrap things up now. When um, Legend of yeah. Anui came out, we we did the we did our video coverage of it, and everyone hated us. We we finally did it. We did a thing, and we didn't mess it up. Yep. <laughs> yep. Add so, par add par add a party blowing sound effect. Chip. Uh, the post uh, Okay. So we'll see <laughs> you next week. We'll, we'll, we'll see it. We'll see you uh, two weeks from now for the first part of uh, Gathered Friends G two, right? <laughs> right, guys. Or, or no, it'll go uh, just as well as Bionicle G two. Uh, we're going <laughs> to do. We were going to do a bonus episode about Star Wars. <laughs> we'll we'll do a bunch of bonus episodes in the future. Yep. But, uh, well, but for I, now... I re-listened to all the I re-listened to all the podcasts. We got we 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 found out Levi doesn't want Levi hadn't seen any of the Star Wars, so we were gonna. I have seen I've seen three Star Wars. The, the which original. which three? Which original? What do you mean which original? The the, the ones the Star Wars. The, the ones, ones that were like, made first. I like the ones Star- where people say I, Star Wars and they mean them. I like Star Wars. <laughs> Star Wars is a movie. You're being extremely vague. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Then speaking of vague... Let's get this over with. So, vague. thank you all for coming down. And listening and reading along and, you know, all of that good jazz. It's been a long 22-episode journey, uh, but we've finally come to the end. 
you know, Bionicle, is, it means a lot to a lot of us. And hopefully it means something to you too now, Levi. And, you know, it brought us all together. It, for many of us, it gave us purpose in our lives. And it ultimately led to not only this, but all of us becoming closer friends. Which is For that an... is the way of the Bionicle. God, God damn it, there was another line in the middle of that, and then I was going to say it. I was say <laughs> it. <laughs> you too! It brought us together, it gave us purpose, and made us friends. I it's am! Unity. I know everything that I'm going to do! But it's... I know everything that you're going to do today! It's Strange, you... isn't it? It's Unity, Duty, Destiny. I was making an allusion to the Unity, Duty, Destiny. Unity! Unity uh, Destiny! Okay, okay. End. I think we know. I think I know. We can end this episode off the same way it started with penis. Penis. <laughs> Significant shrinkage. New legends awake, but old lessons must be remembered. This is the way of the Bionicle.